Early in Dishonored, there's an in-game tutorial message that pops up and reads, The upcoming area is riddled with pathways that allow many approaches to accomplishing your mission. Now, besides thinking that riddled was a strange word to use in this context, it strikes me how little justice this message actually does in conveying the amount of options players have in Dishonored. It's actually quite staggering at times, the amount of thought that Arcane Studios put into making each and every space within the game. This likely isn't new information for people who have played the game before, but if you haven't, the best way I can think to describe it is that you always feel like you've just discovered some path or route that no one else ever has. You can't help but smugly think about how you've bested those wily developers and how they couldn't possibly have intended for you to get here. But then you find some treasure or a hidden note and it dawns on you that you're not special after all and that the developers at Arcane Studios are just this good at their jobs. Dishonored's ability to consistently make players feel like they are breaking the game through their creativity is one of the reasons this game and its sequels are so special. For many people, it is the main reason they love this game. I want to be upfront about how much I enjoy this series. I consider the world to be one of the best ever created, and this first game is among my favorite games of all time. I have played all of the games and major expansions in this series, and barring just one exception, I think they have largely gotten better with each new entry. Even acknowledging this, however, the first game still brings back the greatest sense of wonder. The original Dishonored is one of those watershed gaming moments for me, and I feel similarly about it to how I imagine many people feel about the first Halo or Skyrim. It introduced me to a whole new genre of games that I previously had had only limited exposure to, and today many of my favorite games are either immersive sims or stealth-focused. Now, despite my deep appreciation and enjoyment for the original game, I am not blind. Dishonored has problems, big ones. Whenever the game gets discussed, there tends to be three major criticisms that get brought up. First, that the story of the game is bad. Second, the chaos system in the game limits players' choice in a negative way. And third, that the game wants players to play stealthily. I agree with each of these criticisms to varying degrees, but also identify that all three of them are deeply connected. The story of Dishonored, as we'll soon discuss, is tied to the importance of there being consequences for the player's actions, which in turn means that they need to be tracked and measured which they are by an in-game mechanic called the Chaos System. The way a player chooses to approach encounters and different objectives determines, among other things, how much chaos is generated in the world. Unfortunately, this creates problems for Dishonored right from the start, not because this system exists, but because it was set up to fail. From the very first combat encounter, it puts in players' minds that playing this game like Wolfenstein, where you can float between action and stealth, is okay, when really it isn't. Or it is, but as it stands, it's a worse version of the game. Players who choose to play lethally are given higher chaos, which they likely won't meaningfully understand the narrative consequences of until it is too late to change course. In this way, it sets the standard that non-lethality equals low chaos and that lethality equals high chaos. Or put more simply, non-lethality equals good and lethality equals bad. It then rigidly refuses any other possibility for the remainder of the game. This leads to the complaint that the chaos system restricts the game itself, generally forcing players into one of two strict playstyles, either a stealthy good one or a terminator killing people evil one. I agree with this. The game and its choices are not designed in a way to allow players to decide for themselves what is right and wrong. The few choices become meaningless because you're incentivized to just stay in whichever chaos lane you're in as opposed to make the decisions you truly think could be the best. In a previous video, I talked about why the indie game Bastion does such a good job of designing a moral choice. It does so by avoiding labeling its choices as either good or bad. The Witcher series also does this to great effect. It lets the player make the decision based on what they personally feel is right. The later games in the Dishonored series, while better, still struggle with this restrictiveness. Now, despite agreeing with these complaints, I also think the concept of the chaos system is a good one, and I like its attempts to add consequences for the player's actions. I firmly believe it is one of the core pillars of the Dishonored series, but also a problematic one in its current format. 
Taking all of these together, I'm not quite sure what the solution is, but for the next three hours, I'll waffle back and forth like YouTube critics are supposed to do while not really saying anything of substance or adding anything new to the conversation. I'm joking about all that, well, everything other than the length of the video, as you can obviously see. Dishonored is a game that I believe isn't talked about enough, but should be for all that it does right despite its flaws. With this video, I aim to help correct that. I'm not egotistical enough to call this the ultimate critique, but hopefully it's seen as a thoughtful one. My proposed solutions to Dishonored's problem lie in making changes to the chaos system. The game needs to largely decouple the chaos system from a morality system. For it to be impactful, it needs to be more than just killing equals high chaos and thus bad. This is not me saying that players should be able to kill with no consequences. I think given the context of the story in the world, playing as a framed man trying to clear his name in a city sitting on the brink of destruction, it actually makes sense that needless killing would help push the city over the edge. However, the system needs to be more nuanced than just lethal versus non-lethal. There needs to be consequences for your actions, but right now the game feels like there are only consequences for playing lethally. In reality, many of the non-lethal options in the game would actually create just as much or more chaos than the lethal alternative. Unfortunately, the story as it is seems hardly interested in exploring the implications of the player's actions and chaos levels in a more meaningful way. It is focused only on the morality of killing as opposed to the utility of killing someone in this universe. Along with this adjustment, the game needs more substantial ways of showing the changes that are occurring due to your actions. Dishonored currently fails in this regard, with almost no impactful differences between low and high chaos outside of the amount of enemies as well as minor variations in lines of dialogue. I honestly believe that the game would be better had more time been spent thoroughly developing and deepening the chaos system and the stealth systems, as well as restructuring several aspects of the main narrative. By doing so, those three criticisms that I mentioned earlier would be met, and the overall core experience of Dishonored would be strengthened. The remainder of this video will be focused on examining the game in more detail, as well as to provide examples of why these solutions are the correct ones. Part 1 of this video will focus on the prologue and the first level of the game. I want to discuss these two bits together and by themselves because not only are they the introduction to the world and many of the characters, but they also showcase just how thoughtful Arcane can be at crafting in-game moments. The second portion of this video will be the longest, and is focused on the middle section of the game which follows a cycle. Each one of the missions involve getting a target, getting dropped off at a corresponding location, and then being left to handle the situation as you see fit. This section will also feature extensive critiques and restructuring of the story, choices, and the chaos system, all of which in my opinion are at their weakest during this part of the game. Part 3 of the video will focus on the events that occur after the game's narrative twist. This part of the story has a sharper focus on illustrating the supposed impacts of the player's choices, and while it's certainly better, it still shits the bed a little. The fourth and final section will focus on the internal tug of war at play between the game's combat and stealth systems. Now, lastly, I want to say that if you haven't played the game, I would caution you against watching this video. As I stated at the beginning, discovering surprises both in its world but also in its gameplay are two of the best things about Dishonored. Going into the game without any prior knowledge of the missions or map scenarios is the best way to experience the game, so this is your spoiler warning. Corvo, if only there was someone else I trusted to send, so that you could remain near. But there is no one else, and the Spymaster was right to insist that I send you. The game begins with a short prologue segment that narratively sets up the basics of the plot. You play as a man named Corvo, who is the royal protector and bodyguard to Jessamine Caldwin, Empress of the City of Dunwall. Corvo has been away for some time, having been sent on a mission by the Empress and one of her advisors. Additionally, there is a plague going on within the city, with both its origin and whether a cure is possible unknown at this point. Parallel to the plot setup, this beginning segment also introduces players to several ideas that will become important pieces of the in-game world as well as for gameplay. A long way to bring bad news. The sailors say there's a curse on us. Black magic is dead. Superstition. 
For all we know, there's a cure for the plague by now. Maybe. We live in strange times. Sending the Empress's bodyguard away for a couple of months. That's unusual. Well, this was important. We need help with the rat plague. The plague gets mentioned twice and further clarifies to be a rat plague. This establishes its future importance both in the narrative but also in the gameplay. One of the guards brings up curses and black magic, but it's dismissed as a superstition. Magic is a part of this universe, as we will see, but it's seemingly not part of everyday life. And finally, we're given many visual clues about the world's technology level. In this short section, we see more modern, wheel-driven boats, smoke clouds in the background, and an advanced water flooding system known as a water lock, which controls boats entering into this tower. However, we also see on the escorting guard what looks like a single shot pistol, but also a sword. This visually presents the time period as some sort of industrial revolution. As Corvo enters the tower, he is greeted by Emily, the daughter of the Empress. It is quickly established that these two have a good relationship based on how Emily speaks to him. During this conversation, players are also given a chance to learn the basics of the game's stealth mechanics through a game of hide-and-seek with Emily. Players are introduced to several other characters. First among them are High Overseer Campbell as well as Anton Sokolov. Campbell is the leader of a religious faction called the Overseers, and Sokolov is an eccentric genius inventor. While not important just yet, both of these individuals will be targets in the future. Continuing forward, Corvo finds the Empress arguing with a man named Hiram Burroughs, who serves as the royal spymaster. This position operates as more of an intelligence role, and it was this man who originally suggested Corvo be sent overseas to parlay with the other cities. The spymaster leaves, and Corvo delivers the news he's gathered from the other cities. I hope that one of the other cities had dealt with this before, knew of some cure. This news is very bad. We're at the breaking point. Cowards. They're going to blockade us. They'll wait to see if the plague turns the city into a graveyard. The situation escalates quickly as several masked men teleport into the gardens to attempt an assassination. While initially able to fend them off, more appear utilizing stronger magic, paralyzing Corvo and leading to this. Empress Jessamine Caldwin is murdered and her daughter is kidnapped by the assassins. Several members of the army, along with the spymaster and high overseer, approach the scene and because the assassins have vanished, Corvo is blamed. He is arrested and that is the end of the prologue. As I hinted at during the introduction of this video, the combat section against the assassins is important because it's the first enemy encounter in the game. It is also done poorly. During this segment, it is actively teaching players that playing this way, shooting at enemies and sword fighting is what you do. This is going to create a jarring scenario for both types of players, those that are expecting this to be a methodical stealth game, as well as those that prefer this action-oriented combat, and then get told in the very next mission that killing enemies is going to lead to a darker outcome. I think the obvious fix here is to just make the entire segment a cutscene that players are watching, with this moving the combat tutorials into the beginning of the next segment at the prison. This is already where we get the stealth tutorials, and it would better present them as a mere option in the player's toolkit instead of how the game is played. Additionally, and perhaps another nitpick, but Corvo's job as the royal protector immediately doesn't make sense in this universe. Corvo seems to be the singular special bodyguard for the Empress, but then the game opens with him returning from his journey. He has been gone for two months according to the documents found in the game. In what world does it make sense that the Protector is sent out to meet with the leaders of other cities on his own when his job title is literally as a Protector? Sending the Empress's bodyguard away for a couple of months, that's unusual. 
and I understand that Hiram Burroughs was the one that pushed for Corvo to be sent in the first place, but it makes the Empress seem either dumb or incompetent that she agrees to this. It actually makes more sense that Corvo would be the spymaster given the stealth intentions of the game as well as his natural abilities. Burroughs instead could have been some sort of other advisor, such as a royal financer, given he has a disdain for the poor. The writers at Arcane even at least partially agree with this fit, because in the sequel, Corvo has become the spymaster. It also narratively makes the villain's plan of framing him more believable, a spymaster as opposed to the loyal bodyguard. Her own bodyguard. Ironic. I'll see you beheaded for this, Corvo. Peg him! The real first mission of the game takes place within and around Coldridge Prison, the location that Corvo has been incarcerated at for the six months following the assassination of the Empress. This mission serves mainly as a tutorial for many of the game's mechanics, and because of this it is tightly linear and includes few chances for experimentation. It opens with Corvo getting tortured, as both High Overseer Campbell and the now acting Lord Regent Burroughs unsuccessfully attempt to force a false confession out of him. Knowing that he is to be executed the following day, the pair twirl their metaphorical mustaches and reveal they were the ones behind the assassination and kidnapping. There was nothing personal in this, even though you almost sank our plans, but it turned out well. You were in the wrong place at the right time, and someone has to take the fall. Later, while in his cell, Corvo is visited by an officer who leaves him a note with detailed instructions on how to escape as well as a key to his cell. And escape he does. Players are given the choice to proceed through the prison using either stealth and knocking guards unconscious or by killing them all. Using an explosive device left for him, Corvo is able to blow a hole in the security doors and escape into the nearby sewers. Seeing further instructions, he is to navigate his way to the river where a boatman named Samuel is waiting for him. The primary focus of the sewers is to continue teaching new gameplay mechanics to the player in a contained environment. We get our introduction to a rat swarm. The swarm will attack almost any creature, living or dead, that is in range and will do steady damage to players until they disperse the swarm or get out of range. You also get taught that you can use dead bodies to attract the swarm for a short period of time. This gameplay mechanic had quite a bit of potential, but I was disappointed to learn that it is never necessary again. Unfortunately, dealing with rat swarms, even on the hardest difficulty, never requires much effort. As you progress, the game also tries to teach you to be observant. Arcane is quite deliberate with how they first demonstrate this as well, with traps in the world. As most players travel through the sewers for the first time, they will probably trigger a tripwire unknowingly and be hit by an explosive arrow. This would lead to confusion and cause players to be more observant, which likely means they will see the second tripwire and subsequent trap, this lesson is further reinforced toward the end of the sewers when you find a locked safe and a note containing a clue to the code. The note says to look to whiskey for the answer and again requires players to be observant enough to notice the whiskey sign behind the safe and the code hidden behind the bottles. Together, these teach players that there is actually a reason to pay attention to the game world. Corvo eventually finds a gear stash left for him, which includes a handheld crossbow that acts as the silent alternative to the pistol. The final room in the sewers is what I would consider the first real play space for players, and is a smaller, simplified version of what they can expect from the game going forward. Moving through the sewer passageways afterwards, leads Corvo out to the river where he's greeted by Samuel, the riverboat driver that we'll get plenty of interactions with throughout the game as he ferries Corvo to and from missions. From there, Corvo is taken to meet his new allies, a group called the Loyalists. This is the Hound Pits pub, closed for business. Half the district marked off is dead from the plague. We're right under the Lord Regent's nose and he don't know a thing. 
Corvo arrives at a place called the Hound Pits Pub, an abandoned bar that serves as the group's base of operations. This is a cool location that I'll return to later in this video to discuss a bit more. He is quickly ushered in to meet two of the leaders of the group, Admiral Havelock, who once served with the Royal Navy, as well as nobleman Trevor Pendleton. They reveal they've been hard at work establishing a network of individuals that are loyal to the crown and seek to re-establish the royal family. At risk of execution, we're committed to finding young Lady Emily and seeing her crowned as Empress. We've got big plans, but we can't do any of it without you. We need your skills, your ability in a fight, and in helping us, we're going to help you destroy the men who murdered the Empress. There's one more member of the leadership that isn't introduced yet, so we'll circle back to discuss these three characters later in the video. Continuing the whirlwind of introductions, players are then introduced to Piero, the group's technician and the man who built Corvo's equipment. This interaction serves as both an introduction to the shop and equipment upgrading, but also to teach another gameplay mechanic. The glowing blue whale oil tanks are used to power machinery. This knowledge is critical, as removing these canisters will be used to power off the different security measures in Corvo's path in future missions. Piero himself suffers from being written awkwardly, but also creepily, which is unfortunate. His in-person portrayal actually contrasts against the individual we see in his many journals and audio diaries. Does part of the soul live in the heart? If the heart keeps beating, does that mean that the spirit is never released into oblivion? I can keep a heart beating forever with electricity, but what does that mean for any essence trapped within? It'd be easier if I created these processes in waking hours. I am uneasy pursuing avenues that emanate from my dreaming mind. These paint a much more interesting person, someone who is extremely intelligent and curious, but also extremely arrogant, with both of these traits having led to his expulsion from a prestigious science institution known as the Academy of Natural Philosophy prior to the events of the game. He has a fierce rivalry with its headmaster, the man we saw painting the portrait in the prologue, Anton Sokolov. Instead of showcasing these aspects of him in a more meaningful way, we get scenes like this for whatever reason. I know it looks... I was inventing a new kind of lock. The tumblers... The truth is, there is no snowflake lock. I was just, you know, looking through the lock. Can't you see I'm about to bathe? There are a few other servant type characters that you can interact with around the area, but the majority of them are not important now or ever. Some of them are also laughably bad. The characters of Wallace and Lydia have no significant interactions with Corvo the entirety of the game and are simply there to explain to viewers how the cooking and cleaning get done. And I get that these Navy admirals and people aren't realistically going to be cooking for themselves, but I think a little more effort could have gone into making these two actual characters. I used to be the hostess here. Oh, I could tell you stories about that, believe me. The other two, Callista and Cecilia, are better, as both have important moments in the plot later on, and Callista specifically is actually quite good, as you learn more about her through audio diaries. However, the fact that many of these loyalist members don't feel like actual characters is partly why the game's main narrative suffers. You return to the Hound Pits pub after every mission, and so these are some of the only characters you interact with more than once, yet many of them feel void of personality. The lack of interesting characters at your home base is also in sharp contrast to the many interesting characters out in the world. Two of the characters you can meet are Granny Rags and Slackjaw, both of whom you only interact with two or three times, and yet they still manage to be more compelling characters. I would even go so far as to say Dr. Galvani, who we never physically see in the game and only read his journals, is a more interesting character than many of the NPCs at the pub. This plague has ruined the social season for all of us. 
For now, let's return to the story. Corvo goes to sleep, but awakens in a strange place with a visit from a strange person. I am the outsider, and this is my mark. There are forces in the world and beyond the world, great forces that men call magic. And now, these forces will serve your will. Use this newfound power, my gift to you. Come find me. Corvo must then traverse through this strange realm known as the Void. This area is never clearly explained, which makes it tough to try and do now, although I do think it remaining a mystery is for the better in my opinion, as not everything needs an explanation. One of the bigger faults I have with the sequel and its follow-up expansion are that they give explanations for things that aren't necessary. What is known for sure is that the Void is an alternate, almost dreamlike dimension host to a supernatural being known as the Outsider. Both the Void and the Outsider are sources of power and can grant a special mark to individuals of their choosing, which allows for access to a variety of powers. This is largely seen as black magic by the real world, and I would say accurately, as most of the powers we see throughout the series do have a dark nature to them, such as possessing another living being, creating a horde of attacking rats, or seeing through walls. The introduction of these powers is also one of the final gameplay mechanics and fills out the toolkit players have access to going forward. The Outsider himself grants Corvo his first power called Blink, allowing him to teleport short distances unseen. He also explains to players how to unlock more powers. Seek the ancient runes bearing my mark in the lonely places of your world, and at shrines raised in my name. These runes will grant you powers beyond those of other men. Back in the real world, players can find shrines, runes, and charms that allow for more expansion of the Void abilities. These collectible trinkets are made from the bones of whales, which in this universe are symbols of power. Not only do these creatures serve as a connection to the Void and the Outsider, but their blubber produces the oil that powers much of the world's technology, those glowing blue tanks I talked about earlier. The whales' connection to the Void is never clearly explained, but the whales themselves are often brutally killed in order to create both the whale oil as well as the charms, and this only reinforces the dark nature of these inventions and this place. And now I return you to your world, but know that I will be watching with great interest. Upon waking up and still bearing the Outsider's mark, Corvo is quickly given his first assignment by Admiral Havelock. Well, let's get down to it. First off, I know that assassination is dark business, but sometimes good men have to do bad things to make the world right. Our purpose is clear. We want to restore Her Majesty's line by finding and putting Emily Caldwin on the throne. Sometimes good men have to do bad things, Admiral Havelock reassures just before he briefs you on your first mission. I find this ironic, given that Dishonored seems to have no interest in actually exploring what this line could mean. The next several missions involve taking down the Lord Regent and his allies, with it immediately becoming clear that Corvo will be acting as the knife for this. This is also the point in the game where, in theory, we could begin seeing the consequences of our in-game actions and choices, i.e. the chaos system. Unfortunately, in practice, the level of chaos offers very few meaningful narrative differences for players, and offers only the shallowest of world reactions to the player's choices. To illustrate and prove this, this portion of the video will go through each of the missions in the second act, examining what turned out to only be a small amount of differences between their low and high chaos states. With this, we'll also go over the larger narrative problems that start slow but begin spreading like the rat plague the further into the story we go. And with that, let's begin. Would you join me to drink? Sit and talk a Tonight, High Overseer Camel dies by your hand. It won't be easy. He's protected by his overseers, an army of religious zealots. But if anyone can do it, you can. 
The first target is High Overseer Campbell, who we've interacted with before as he was present during both your interrogation as well as the Empress's murder. This mission sets up three primary objectives for you. First, deal with the High Overseer himself. Second, find his journal, which is thought to contain details on Emily's location. And third, to rescue a man named Teague Martin, who is a former overseer and member of the Loyalist organization. In addition to these primary objectives, you also receive a secondary one before leaving the Hound Pits. As you approach the boat, you officially meet Callista, who will be the caretaker and teacher for Emily once she is rescued. She tells you that her uncle, Jeff Kernow, is a captain in the City Watch and a good man. The High Overseer is planning on having him poisoned because he can't be bribed after an incident, and so in turn, Callista asks you to find a way to protect her uncle. We have in fact briefly met Jeff Kernow as he is one of the guards seen in the prologue who traveled with Corvo on his journey overseas. This seems very random, especially with how Callista brings it up. She bumbles through asking for your help and doesn't once mention that you, Corvo, know her uncle because he traveled around the world with you. My guess would be that a line like this was probably in the game, but was omitted because Arcane thought players wouldn't make the connection and it would only confuse them. That may be true, but I think it's just as weird that they decided to make Kernow even part of your voyage in the first place, given that it was unnecessary and these might as well have been two separate characters. Or rather, if they really wanted it to be the same person, he could have had some sort of impact or importance later in the story, but as it stands, he doesn't. In fact, after this mission, we'll never see him again. Samuel the Boatman ferries you to a safe spot along the river, just a few blocks from your target. I really like these intro rides that happen each mission, as they create a sort of bond between you two as you're the ones risking your necks out in the field. During the different rides, Sam gives helpful information to players about either the area or sometimes individuals or enemies that they might meet. It also serves to develop him as one of the few at the Hound Pits that actually seem like they lived in the city and understand it, specifically in a way that these rich nobles, royal protectors, and high-ranking military personnel don't. This in turn makes him one of the best written characters in the game. After arriving in the area, many players will move down the walkway beneath the bridge, eventually arriving before a guard station and a security checkpoint. Up to this point in Dishonored, things have been pretty contained and focused on teaching players the various mechanics of the game. Immediately out of the gate, this level is much more open, not open world, but designed in a way that there are many more possible routes through the encounters. This mission is based in two areas, and for now let's spend some time in the first section, the Distillery District, which is comprised of its main street, surrounding alleyways, houses, and the former whiskey distillery itself. Members of the City Watch patrol the main street, utilizing machinery called a wall of light to create security checkpoints. This device creates an unseen wall that vaporizes and kills you if you cross its threshold. The side alleys feature no patrol presence, but have instead been taken over by a local group called the Bottle Street Gang, who operate out of the nearby distillery. It's in this side area that we meet one of the most interesting secondary characters in the game, Granny Rags. Is that you, my dear husband? Oh, my eyes aren't what they used to be. While initially she seems like just an odd, delusional older woman, early on you can catch glimmers that not everything is as it appears with her and she might actually have a nasty streak. This is eventually confirmed much later in the game. Do you remember my doctor, dear? Dr. Galvani? Now there was a clever man. And in addition to appearing quite strange, Granny Rags also has abilities given to her from the Outsiders, similar to Corvo. It's through Granny Rags that we also get one of the most interesting side quests in the game, one that could have been used to showcase a true chaos system as well as how your actions impact the city. Granny Rags has an ongoing feud with the Bottle Street gang that reside in the distillery, and at first it appears like she's the victim. The gang members harass and attempt to shake her down for money. However, after dealing with the first group of gang members, she asks Corvo to go one step farther for her. The leader of the Bottle Street gang is a man known as Slackjaw, and we are informed that he runs a bootleg elixir scheme out of the nearby distillery, selling a watered-down version of the plague elixir in order to make a profit. 
Granny instructs you to sneak into a nearby residence of a Dr. Galbani, a medical doctor and scientist who has also been secretly working with plague rats in an attempt to develop a cure. She tasks you with finding something in his lab that could be used to poison the Bottle Street Gang's elixir supply, and on top of that promises to reward you with a whalebone rune if you complete the job. Choosing not to help Granny with this task has no consequences outside of losing out on an additional rune to upgrade your powers. If you do help her though and poison the elixir distill, the next mission you can return to the distillery and see the consequences. As I stated earlier, this level is based in two areas, the first being the distillery district that we've spoken about, and now the second, which is centered on the facilities of the religious organization known as the Overseers. The man you've been sent to deal with is Thaddeus Campbell, the High Overseer and leader of this organization. The Overseers are quite interesting and are one of my favorite factions in the series. They are the militant branch of a religion called the Abbey of the Everyman, which stands in direct opposition to the Outsider. Throughout the facility you can find bits of lore about the group, their history, beliefs, and equipment. It's particularly interesting because we know that the Outsider does exist and does grant dark magic to people. People make trinkets of bone in his honor, so the Overseers aren't wrong about his power and influence. But on the other hand, they are fanatical and just as bad themselves. They have archaic and outdated ideologies, they don't care much for hard evidence, and even kidnap young boys who they put through brutal trials. Those that survive become witchers. You were expecting me. Or rather, overseers. Almost all of the overseers we see in the game appear to be rigid and lacking compassion. Overseer Sturgis. My youngest sister lives with my wife and me, but does not cook or clean. She thinks on curious subjects, machinery and numerical calculations. And only yesterday she spoke of a wish to read a book. What shall I do? This is very troubling. For such a young lady is easy prey to the outsider. If not already within his grasp, watch her carefully for signs of it. She may fall into fit, or be heard speaking to the empty air or laugh, or cry without provocation. Perhaps a disfigured man may come and inquire after her. Or you might discover small items in the house, branded as if by intense heat. Or the bones of rats may be found in her bedclothes. Be wary. And the High Overseers aren't much better themselves. The two we see over the course of the game are both power-hungry, with Thaddeus Campbell helping plan the murder of an empress. It's not easy to say if they are better or worse than those that use the Outsider's abilities, particularly the witches and cults we see more of in the future games, and I like this. As you enter the area that features their compound, you witness an Overseer taunting another who is in stocks. I hear the second day is when the skin really starts to come all the way off. Is that true? Or is it the itching that really gets you? Or the rats? Jasper, isn't it? It's not so bad in here, except I miss your wife. After incapacitating the guard, Corvo releases the man and is introduced to Martin, a former overseer who helped Corvo escape the prison, but had been found out. He is actually one of the three masterminds behind the loyalist group that Corvo now works with. Martin makes his exit, and as we continue forward, players can overhear an important conversation. I was just reading in the archive about the heretic's brand. It sounds painful. Have you ever seen the ritual? I've never seen the heretic's brand used. No, it's a rare occurrence. But I did spy the face of one so brand. A former member of our order, of course. Out on a retreat, we passed through a fishing town and saw him begging. What were his crimes? Who can say? The brand is reserved for an overseer. Or even the High Overseer himself, who violates our codes and must be cast out permanently. Remember the Seven Strictures, and you never need worry about such matters. I will, brother. This introduces players to the gameplay mechanic that each of their targets will have a non-lethal approach to being dealt with. So in this case, players can locate this brand used to mark heretics and use it on High Overseer Campbell as opposed to assassinating him. Once branded, he will be thrown out and excommunicated, effectively removing him from the board in the same way that killing him would have. 
While I think having a non-lethal alternative for each of the targets is a terrific idea, unfortunately Arcane labels all of them as the low chaos option and I think that that was a misstep. A more nuanced approach to these would have been better as I don't think it's always fair to say that not killing the target is the better option for the city itself. One of the later non-lethal options in the game has horrible implications morally, and many of the others easily could destabilize the city themselves. Looking at this mission as an example, perhaps killing Campbell makes overseers become easier to deal with because the group as a whole lacks leadership and is demoralized. The game already builds this potential up as well as later conversations with Martin indicate that the overseers have become directionless. In contrast, if you branded him as a heretic, maybe the overseers become more bloodthirsty and harder to deal with. The in-game explanation for this could be that many different individuals are now vying for the position and there is a power struggle for who will become the next high overseer. The overseers could become even more zealous in order to prove themselves and also after faced with the realization that the previous high overseer was a sham. This fits with the narrative as well because Martin ultimately wins that position later in the game by utilizing Campbell's journal in order to blackmail the others. I say all of this because so much thought already went into giving the player so many options that it feels strange that the chaos aspect of this is so rigid. Outside of the non-lethal approach and outside of the bum rush method, there is actually another option for killing Campbell that's centered on the side objective that was given to you by Callista back at the pub. Her father, Jeff Kernow, is meeting with Campbell and it is suspected that the High Overseer is going to poison him. You can sneak into their meeting room and find the evidence with the glasses and poisoned wine. With just this scenario, you were given many options. You can swap the glasses so Campbell is poisoned instead of Kernow. No. Oh no. This can't be happening. Who's done this? What on earth are you talking about? No time, no time. Listen carefully. You must instruct the Lord Regent to burn the Black Book. Understand? Burn it! What Black Book? What do you mean? And then warn them, and then die of plague, you useless incompetent! I never liked you! What the Campbell? You can poison them both. Feel my hands. Really? Can you feel yourself dying, you ridiculous parasite? What did you say? <laughs> Campbell? Or you can smash the glasses, which only leads to a further alternative path where Campbell takes Kernow down to his secret room in order to kill him. And even within this room itself, there are small details you can use to your advantage. There is music playing in the room, and if you turn it off at just the right second, it causes Kernow to realize Campbell was trying to kill him. If there's a pretty lady in it, guard to me! They're going down! This route with Kernow actually figuring it out could have caused the Overseers and City Watch to further dislike each other, which maybe could have allowed Corvo to use this strained relationship to his benefit in a future mission somehow. Or alternatively, maybe saving Kernow allows for him to give some sort of benefit, like maybe helping in a later mission. Callista even hints at this later on. My uncle's a good man, and one day he'll prove it. But nothing ever comes from it. Once Campbell has been dealt with, you can find his journal on his person, and then you are free to locate Samuel, which exits the level. Before returning to the Hound Pits pub, however, there's one last thing I want to examine, the actual differences we see in this level depending on whether the player is currently at high or low chaos. Outside of more rats, I was able to find only two differences, both just being dialogue from enemies on the map and neither being what I would consider impactful. I want to show both of these though so there's a proper level of understanding when I say just how inconsequential they both are. The first is from a lone overseer in the archives who's investigating Corvo's escape. Back to the beginning. It was Martin's plot to break him out of Coldridge prison 
That's clear enough. But why? The one man feared throughout the Empire. He's as skilled as they say. He got through there with half the watch looking for him. He had help, yes, but how far does it go? The trail goes to Martin, but Martin knows everyone. Everywhere. Back to the beginning. It was Martin's plot to break him out of Corvo's prison. That's clear enough. But why Corvo? The one man feared throughout the Empire. He's as bloody-minded as they say. Left a trail of bodies. And the way he dodged the axe, we can't rule out black magic. He had help, yes, but how far does it go? The trail goes to Martin, but Martin knows everyone. Everywhere. This is it, a couple of sentences. The second is from a group of overseers in the backyard area. You're just feeling off, that's all. It's no use. I'm sick. I can taste blood. It's been days. You know what you have to do. Stop it! I'll give you my share of elixir. Nonsense. I don't want to bleed from the eyes and lose my mind. I don't want to spread the plague to anyone else. Don't fall prey to restless hands. I'm asking you to do this because you've known me for so long. Can you do it? Will you? Yes, my friend. I will. Before you weep. Before you bring down the rest of us. Thank you. Turn your back, my friend. Recite the seven strictures. I will make it fast. Restrict the wandering eyes that look hither and yonder for some flashing thing that easily catches. What brings calamity in the next? No, it's just a little cough. Fine. I feel completely fine. Fine? Look at you. You have the plague. You are trying to conceal it from us, your brothers in the Order. Was that your intent? To spread the malady to us? No, friend. I, I tell you, I am well. <coughs> as fit as ever. Put down your weapons. Just think for a moment before you... He was sick. Very, very sick. That much I'm sure. While this one is better, it again doesn't actually change much. It's still the one overseer dying in either scenario, and it doesn't have any consequences on the level itself. And unfortunately, these are it. Now, I am willing to give this level somewhat of a pass, because while it's technically the second mission, it feels more like the first real mission, and it's a very good one at that. Unfortunately, the next mission does little to actually demonstrate that the chaos system matters, and this is even despite the introduction we are about to get to a new enemy type. Upon returning and briefly resting at the Hound Pits pub, Corvo is asked by Admiral Havelock to deal with what he suspects are weepers in the sewers below. Weepers are people who were infected by the plague and have progressed to the final stage of sickness. They have become a little more than mindless husks who stumble around. This is the final gameplay mechanic in the game and is directly tied to the chaos system, with high chaos supposedly leading to more weepers during missions, although this is overall inconsistent. Corvo goes into the sewers to deal with them, and while I don't think it is incredibly important, I do find it funny that the game goes so far as to inform players that they can use sleeping darts to knock them unconscious, but then don't explain what is going to be done with the bodies. Is Admiral Havelock going to just kill the Weepers after I leave? Or are they going to be dropped off in another district? Or are they just going to be left down there? It's never explained, and it just comes across as silly that the game goes through the trouble of giving me a non-lethal alternative for dealing with these Weepers, but just kind of throws its hands up at what that actually means, especially because as far as the characters currently know, there isn't and won't be a cure for this level of sickness. Even the concept of a cure doesn't make sense given that to reach this stage in the plague likely means that there's some sort of permanent brain damage that has been done to the infected. 
Again, not a big deal, but it was something I noticed. After you deal with the Weepers, you are briefed by the three ringleaders of the group about your next assignment. Pendleton's waiting for you on the dock. He's asked to brief you personally. I think it's best. There's going to be a lot to discuss within this mission, and because of this, I think it's necessary to tackle it in a hyper-organized fashion. First, we'll go through the main narrative of this mission, discussing it in detail as well as any criticisms of it. Then, we'll rewind and discuss the mission in regards to the Chaos System. You are informed that Emily Caldwin has been located. We know where Emily Caldwin is being held. The Golden Cat, of all places. A bathhouse for aristocrats. Little better than a cursed brothel. But there's an unfortunate twist. It appears that Pendleton's own kinsmen stand in our way. The twins, Morgan and Custis. Not only are they controlling Emily, but they have the controlling parliamentary votes we so desperately need. In addition to finding her, you must also deal with Lord Pendleton's twin older brothers, who are also at the Golden Cat themselves. Lord Pendleton discusses the matter with you privately, where he coldly justifies why his brothers need to go. Samuel ferries you into the distillery district once again, and the mission officially starts. Right away, Corvo is given a lead that Slackjaw, leader of the Bottle Street Gang, might be able to help with his objectives. The way I figure it, there ain't nobody worth killing around here except those two Pendletons over at the Golden Cat. I'm right, ain't I? See, Slackjaw knows. This leads to a two-part questline where Corvo and Slackjaw trade favors in a matter that would make Donald Trump blush. Someone is killing members of the Bottle Street Gang, and Slackjaw has sent one of his men to investigate a possible lead. However, the man, named Crowley, hasn't returned. If this quest is pursued, Corvo can discover that Crowley has been killed, and in exchange for this information, he is given access to a rooftop entrance into the Golden Cat. The second part of this quid pro quo arrangement sees Slackjaw offer to non-lethally handle the Pendleton twins for you if you get him the safe combination of an art dealer named Bunting. Completing this quest is required if players are going for a clean hands, no killing playthrough as it's the only non-lethal method of dealing with the twins, Custis and Morgan Pendleton. Corvo can find the art dealer Bunting conveniently also at the Golden Cat himself, and it's one of the most funny interactions in the game in my opinion. Now just like last time, understand? Slowly, and only trigger the shock at my command. Get it? And the safe word tonight will be... retribution, let's say. You hear that, you stop. One shock out of line and you are out of a job. Oh! Oh, that's good. I deserve that one. Shall I tell you why? After a bit of this, he eventually gives Corvo the safe combination, which can then in turn be given to Slackjaw. And with the deal now complete, the gang leader reveals his intentions for the twins. To send them down as forced workers into their own silver mines, but not before shaving their heads and removing their tongues so they are unrecognizable. While this method is efficient and is the non-lethal option, it actually does a disservice to a unique feature that this level incorporates. This mission is one of two in the game that has a randomization factor to it. The twins, Custis and Morgan, each have two different rooms they can be located in within the Golden Cat bathhouse. While the majority of these rooms don't offer anything remarkably different from each other, they do mix up how the players are able to approach the situation when going in stealth. The exception to this is the steam room in the basement where Morgan Pendleton can appear. It has a creative method of killing him involving overloading the steam pipes. What is that noise? Oh no. No, no, no. My problem with this is that by making the non-lethal option something where players don't interact with the twins themselves, it becomes kind of a wasted potential that they even change locations to begin with. The second instance of this randomization factor is the costume party mission coming up, and it handles this much better. After dealing with the twins, lethally or non-lethally, Corvo finds Emily locked in one of the upstairs boarding rooms. 
After a brief reunion, they escape through a special exit and make their way to Sam, who boats them back to the Hound Pits pub. Unfortunately, large aspects of this mission setup don't really make sense when you think about them, and worse, they actually seem rushed. In fact, it almost feels like these two objectives, the one of rescuing Emily and the other of killing the Pendleton twins, were originally each their own mission, but maybe at some point in development had to be condensed into a single mission. The big issue is that we, the player, don't have any personal relationship or background with the Pendleton twins, and the only information we do have is given to us by their brother Trevor, who just lists a bunch of reasons why his brothers are bad. From earliest memory, they abused me in every way. I'm not the first to claim their elder siblings were cruel, but my suffering was unique, I promise you. They're horrible men. It's true, as you may have heard, cruel beyond words. And while being asshole politicians who only care about themselves during a national pandemic certainly makes you evil in my book, I don't think this works well when it's the only motivator, especially when compared to someone like High Overseer Campbell, who both through previous interactions as well as expertly crafted environmental storytelling we saw as a bad person. It also doesn't make sense why the twins have control of Emily in the first place. With how close the office of the High Overseer is, it makes more sense that Campbell would be the one in charge of guarding Emily. This is actually already supported in the game as well. Visiting her twice a week has given me ample opportunity to inspect the facilities, as they say. So there's an upside, at least. Prior to his death, Campbell visited Emily twice a week, and this only further reinforces that the Pendleton twins should have been their own mission. If the developers really wanted there to be a target during this Rescue Emily mission, it makes sense to have it be a lieutenant for the City Watch instead. All the pieces are in play. He controls the City Watch. Through Campbell, he had the religious faction. Someone is funding the military. And he currently has a majority in Parliament. Yes. I'm aware of that. My brothers control the voting block for my family. Admiral Havelock mentions each of these areas, the City Watch, the religious faction, someone funding the military, and the control in Parliament, and each of these has an associated target we go after, except for the City Watch. Or alternatively, maybe the target could have just been the owner of the brothel, Madame Prudence. You could show her abusing the women who work for her, or maybe selling one of them off. In fact, the non-lethal method of taking care of her could have actually been one that we see in a later mission, knocking her unconscious and giving her to an admirer. This punishment would fit much more thematically with her, given that she is using younger women and their bodies for her own profit. This is, of course, with the notion that that specific non-lethal method needed to stay in the game, which I don't think it does, but I'll discuss that more later in this video. Continuing with the idea that these two objectives should have been their own missions, after rescuing Emily, Corvo could then have been sent to kill the Pendleton twins, and I think the most logical place narratively for that to happen would be a parliament building. This shift would have worked for a number of reasons, foremost that it would create ways to flesh out the twins as actual evil characters. After returning with Emily to the Hound Pits pub, Martin mentions that there isn't any rioting in the streets around the pub. Not that the streets around us are pleasant, but there's no rioting at least. And this strikes me as an odd line because at no point anywhere in the game do we see rioting of any kind. However, riots or protests would actually fit quite well into a setting based around the government legislation building. It's established that the Pendletons run a silver mine. My cousin's a foreman at their mine. He says the slaves have dug half a mile down, so deep they're dying by the dozen from collapse or fumes, but the silver's almost gone. So naturally, maybe the protesters are the families of those who work in the mines. The Pendletons could still be in randomized rooms around the Parliament building, similar to how they are in the Golden Cat, and we could witness their plans to violently curb the protesters. The non-lethal option for taking care of the twins could even still be the same with this setup, but instead requiring players to carry both of the unconscious bodies out of the building and give them to the protesters. This as well fixes the current problem of the randomized locations being essentially pointless when you don't have to interact with them. 
Hell, this could even tie into Wallace back at the Hound Pits pub. Maybe he asked the players to attempt to find another way of dealing with the twins because he knows that his lord doesn't want them to actually die. He could be the one who tells you to find the leader of the protesters. This would provide some value to the character of Wallace, who doesn't do anything the entire game. Until then, well, there is plenty of silver to polish. And with all these suggestions, some of you might be thinking, Jesus, why do you care so much about the main story? This is Dishonored, it's an immersive sim, and I just want tons of options and ways of playing the game creatively. And my answer to you is that I care because Arcane Studio cares. Yes, their primary focus as a studio might be on level design and gameplay, but have you seen how many documents and lore books they have scattered throughout every level in this game? How many conversations you can overhear between characters? I don't believe you genuinely put this much time and effort into creating this world and the characters in it unless you care about it. And the potential is there for a good story to be told. They proved this with the expansion that came after this game that centers on the assassin Dowd. Because of this, even if these criticisms come across as harsh, I also think they should come across as fair. Now, I want to turn our attention to the player's chaos level and how it impacts this level. I wish I could say that there are massive changes depending on whether you have low or high chaos, but unfortunately it's more of the same from the previous level. Outside of the number of rat swarms or weepers that appear, most differences are in a few bits of dialogue we can hear. My men were right. You do look like a man out for murder. Way I figure it, there ain't nobody. He is a villain if I judge your looks aright. A villain I might have some work for. Somebody put plague in the brute tank. Half my men are weepers. Trapped three of them in the distillery. Rest are wandering in the street. Since it's so and I find myself short of able bodies, I may have a point of interest for you, see? Way I figure it, there ain't nobody worth Attention, Dunwall citizens. Thaddeus Campbell, formerly High Overseer, is no longer a citizen of Dunwall. He now bears the Heretics brand, and by one of the oldest traditions of the Abbey of the Everyman, it is now a minor criminal offense to offer this man aid or housing. In this time of spiritual crisis, the Overseers have initiated the painted kettle until a new High Overseer is chosen. Attention, Dunwall citizens. Anyone with information pertaining to the death of High Overseer Thaddeus Campbell is to report to the City Watch for immediate questioning. There's a black market seller named Griff who you could save in the previous mission, and if you didn't, he is now a weeper. These are basically it, and I'm not joking either. What's worse is that the two big side choices we were asked to make in the previous mission, the first being whether to save Captain Kernow from being poisoned, and the second, deciding whether to infect the Bottle Street Elixir Distill for Granny Rags, they ultimately end up being just as meaningless. And this is where I begin to get confused by what Arcane's goal was with the Chaos System and giving players choices at all. These side objectives could have and should have been a really impactful way of showing players early in the game that their choices have consequences, but they aren't used this way. In regards to saving Captain Kernow or not, this choice's whole impact is showcased in a note. To put this in context, this level features a new security measure, the Watchtower, which are automated towers that fire explosive ammunition at you when they spot you. If Kurnow was poisoned and died, the note says that this tower was built in his honor. If he survived, it says that it was built on his orders. This is so bad. The fact that there's a watchtower at all in this first area could have and should have been directly tied to your choice to save Captain Kurnow or not. A beloved city watch captain getting killed narratively explains why there would be increased defenses installed. Him surviving thanks to my actions and then building this regardless feels contradictory. In fact, if I ghost the entire level, killing no one, am not seen, and I use the heretic brand on Campbell, 
then there realistically shouldn't be any increased security measures at all. And listen, I understand that that wouldn't make for good level design, especially when revisiting the same location. But I do think that my point stands about the Watchtower, specifically because Arcane chose to highlight that it was directly related to Captain Kernow. No matter. This once I'll just go my own way, and you yours. Now let's discuss the bigger of the two choices from the previous mission, deciding whether to poison the Bottle Street Gang's elixir distill or not. The game labels this the High Chaos option, and rightfully so in my opinion, because your actions help spread the plague, so surely if you poisoned it, there should be consequences. Well, it appears that for all intents and purposes, it was fully contained to just members of the Bottle Street Gang, about half of which got infected, although that's lip service because we only see a handful. The leader of the gang, Slackjaw, is fine in either scenario, and as we discussed, he still trades favors with Corvo in either scenario as well. Now, at this point, I want to give a somewhat long-winded example of how these choices could have made more of an impact. And I know that the changes I'm going to suggest are essentially pointless because they would have required much more work from the developers in order to implement, coupled with the fact that I suspect the chaos system as a whole was likely simplified at some point in order to meet the game's development cycle. On top of this, I also know that many people probably think the way the system currently works is fine, but I'd ask that you still hear me out. And so like that grandmother in Majora's Mask who tells the long-winded stories that nobody in particular wants to hear, hopefully you can stay awake. A large point of revisiting this same map should be to show players how things have changed based upon their choices and chaos level. Imagine if the player's actions in this area during their first visit led to different world states that gave players a different experience in this district for the second visit. During the process of writing this script, I've come up with around four different scenarios that could have occurred based upon the choices of poisoning the elixir distill in combination with whether players saved Kurnow or not. And to be clear, I'm not saying these are somehow the best ideas, I'm just some guy with a YouTube channel, not one of the incredibly creative minds over at Arcane. These are just a few ideas that I thought could be meaningful. Let's start with the scenario where you save Kurnow and did not do the poisoning. The guard presence could still be heavy along the main street and the Bottle Street gang still located in the neighboring alleyways. This would be largely the version we already have in the game currently, minus the first watchtower given that Kurnow is alive. Now, let's say that players let Kurnow get poisoned but still didn't infect the still. I think a natural repercussion of this would be that the Bottle Street gang are in higher numbers, maybe actively trying to push into the main street, and as a consequence to this and Kurnow's death, the guards have set up more security to try and stop them. The chaos implications of this could be muddy as well, because while the gang isn't hostile towards Corvo in this mission, is the street gang having more control really a good thing? In the first mission, we see them hassling both Granny Rags, as well as the black market dealer named Griff, but by that same standard, we don't see many good City Watch members either. We'll approach from the back stoop. They won't be alarmed when they see me. Right. Good man. It's them or us. No room for heroes in the time of plague. Just do your job and I'll make sure you keep this posting. In the inverse scenario where the still is poisoned but you don't let Kurnow die, the guards could expand into the alleyway and the entire distillery could be highly infested with those that have the plague, including Slackjaw. This would serve as a great consequence because Slackjaw is the character who provides the non-lethal elimination for the second mission's targets, so you directly feel the impacts of your decision. Because of your choice from the previous mission, you are unable to do a non-lethal route for this mission. Ironic. Lastly, in the final scenario where you both let Kurnow die and complete the poisoning of the still, there could be plague-infected people everywhere in the district, with low guard and low gang presence. This could be, in theory, the least difficult option for players, but at the cost that you're seeing the city die. Another idea for a consequence to poisoning the elixir could be based on a document you find in Slackjaw's office, a list of people he sells his bootleg elixir to. 
One location on that list is the Golden Cat, the brothel where Emily is being held. In the second mission, you can actually find the elixir shipment at the Golden Cat with a note from the gang. In a scenario where you infected the elixir distill, maybe some of it got sent here and has infected the workers at the Golden Cat. This could completely change how the Golden Cat part of the mission feels, as instead of guards, it would now be weepers and trapped guests. It presents players with a real cause and effect. They caused this. It would also provide an opportunity for players to write their course if they wanted to. Perhaps there would be a method of disabling all of the weepers, allowing the guests to escape. This in turn could lower the player's chaos level. This idea of different world states might seem like a lot of work, but it's something the game already does with its final mission, and because of it, it's the only level that truly achieves the promise of your actions feeling like they have consequences. More than anything, this district feels like the place that needed to have big, impactful differences because it's the only location outside of the pub that you'll visit more than once. It could have been the perfect location to show off just how different the city can become based on your actions. This mission in particular gets talked about quite a bit for everything it does right, and I'll admit that the Golden Cat mission is one of the best in the game, however that doesn't excuse the problems it has. It might sound like I'm nitpicking, and maybe I am, but the Dishonored series is special to me, and I think it's important to highlight the things that should be improved for any future releases. And with that, I've likely spent way too long on discussing just this one mission, so let's move on. You return to the Hound Pits pub briefly, but are quickly sent back out due to an opportunity that has arisen. There's a footnote in Campbell's journal that tells us the Lord Regent's mistress sat for a portrait with Sokolov, the painter and royal physician. He'll be able to give us her name. Sokolov lives on Caldwin's Bridge about half the time, out over the river. The catch is that I'm afraid you've got to head out right away while Sokolov is at his apartment on the bridge. Samuel can get you close to the bridge, but you'll have to find Sokolov. Bring him back here intact, and it'll enable us to make our next move. This reasoning is incredibly forced. Its primary goal is obviously setting up the next mission where we will be going after that mistress, but it has the consequence of making Sokolov himself seem like an afterthought. And while it's reasonable to want to set up the next mission, I think it's also more reasonable that the loyalist just extracted the name of the mistress herself from Campbell's Black Book. If you poison Campbell, his dying words make it clear that he knows how damning this book is. No time, no time. Listen carefully. You must instruct the Lord Regent to burn the Black Book. Understand? Burn it! What Black Book? What do you mean? Tell him. Warn them. And then die of plague, you useless incompetent! So it makes sense that it ends up containing basic information on all of the Regent's allies. It could even be structured in the same way, where they can't find the mistress's full name, so it still leads to the mystery in the next mission. The motives for abducting Sokolov could have instead been that the Loyalists were worried that after now eliminating three of the key allies, the Lord Regent's paranoia would prompt Sokolov to develop new and even deadlier security devices. Which, as it turns out, is true. We see one of them, the Arc Pylon, for the first time in this mission. The Arc Pylons operate in a similar fashion to the Wall of Light that was introduced in the first mission, but instead of it being a checkpoint design that operates in a straight line, it instead functions as an area of effect. If you enter into its range, it disintegrates you. Additionally, it would make sense that the Loyalists wouldn't want him outright assassinated because he is potentially useful to them. If we could bring him to our side, think what he and Piero could accomplish together. This gives value to Sokolov himself as a target and not just as a means of reaching someone else. This level introduces us to the location of Caldwin's Bridge, which is a massive bridge that spans the river. The bridge is typically open to the public, but due to the Rat Plague, it is currently locked down by the City Watch, and on top of that, has been fitted with many pieces of technology designed by Sokolov. Samuel is forced to drop you off on the opposite side of the bridge due to the many floodlights set up along it that are watching the waterway. 
turning off these floodlights will become one of your primary objectives in order to allow Sam access to the pickup location. Your path is a straight shot through the tightly packed residential and industrial neighborhoods that make up the area on either side of the bridge. Each of the maps are connected to the previous one by a single door, which limits your entrance and exit locations to always the same spots. This is actually one of my big complaints for this mission, as compared to the two previous levels, the one at the Office of the High Overseer and then the Golden Cat, this level feels uncharacteristically simple and frankly too easy. With a fully upgraded blink, it's incredibly easy to simply bypass everything in this level, and it's for this reason that I think it's among the worst designed levels from a gameplay perspective in the game, maybe in the series as a whole. This level is highly vertical, but outside of the actual Caldwin Bridge segment of the level, there are no guards or defenses above the street. This means blinking between rooftops presents no challenge outside of mispositioning your teleportation and falling. There is no need for any of the other powers or tactically taking out guards at any point in this level. The target, Sokolov, is located in his greenhouse atop his mansion in the final map area, which sounds fine until you realize that it is completely accessible from the outside, again using Blink. There are no defenses near or in the greenhouse, and the single door isn't even locked. I knew someone would come eventually, but you're not what I expected. Characterization-wise, for a self-proclaimed genius who has built incredible security tech, this seems pretty stupid. Perhaps a good alternative could have been placing an arc pylon inside the greenhouse that players would need to locate the power source for in order to turn it off. This could be some sort of generator like the ones on the ground floor. As it currently stands, players have no reason to enter his house at all if they don't want to. This is a shame because Sokolov's house itself has quite a cool layout, and it feels like the design foundation for what eventually would give us the Clockwork Mansion in the second game. But there's no reason to explore it. There aren't any runes or bone charms, no side objectives require you to break in, and there aren't any unique differences within based on your chaos level. The only worthwhile collectible is a portrait you can find of some woman. Lord Regent's mistress sat for a portrait with Sokolov, the painter. Given the narrative setup for this mission, I actually don't understand why players aren't required to grab this portrait of Lady Boyle. It's literally something brought up by Admiral Havelock in the pre-mission briefing, and it narratively could make sense to use for the questioning of Sokolov. Not to mention, it would provide a reason for infiltrating the house. In regards to the character of Sokolov specifically, I find it a bit hypocritical that he is given a pass for his actions when characters like the Pendleton twins or the next target, Lady Boyle, aren't. We know more about Sokolov than any of those I just mentioned, and he is in a lot of ways just as bad as them, if not worse. One of the three side objectives in this mission is deciding to release a group of civilians that are being held as future test subjects for him. Now you listen to me. It's none of our concern the how or why of things. And if you want your elixir rations, then I suggest you stop your wondering. These are pigs. Pigs for Sokolov's experiments. All the and others. pigs mean nothing to me. Sickness. Understand? Right, right. I mean, why worry about a couple of disgusting smelly pigs, you know? In the area around his house, we can hear further discussion about the work he is doing. I'm not asking to know what's going on up there. I was just asking if you heard the screams, too. Of course I've heard them. I would be more worried if there were no screams. As well as from Sokolov himself. As for Test Subject 312, after the characteristic sloughing of the skin, she should be dead by mid-morning tomorrow. Really? You'll release me tomorrow? I'm not gonna die. Yes. Tomorrow, I will have the guards remove you from this cell. Late morning, perhaps. This mission also features a rune shrine where we can speak with the outsider, and during that interaction, he shares his own thoughts on Sokolov as well. Sokolov believes there are specific words and acts that can compel me to appear before him. He searches old temples in Pendicia and ruined sub basements in the flooded district. He performs disgusting rituals beneath the old abbey. But if he really wants to meet me, he could start by being a bit more interesting. 
The point I'm trying to make is that he is no better than the other targets we at least have the option to kill. He is working to develop a cure for the rat plague, yes, but he is also coldly experimenting on live, healthy people, presumably giving them the plague in order to test his formulas. These aren't volunteers either, and the side effects seem to usually cause horrific and painful deaths. At the time of writing this, in 2022 and after the global COVID-19 pandemic, this seems highly unethical, especially for someone who's positioned as the royal physician. And I want to be clear that this isn't me saying that Sokolov needed to die, but just that Arcane is inconsistent with their messaging within the game. This sits as another example showing how little interest Dishonored has in discussing morality in any way outside of killing is bad and not killing is good. In fact, I think keeping Sokolov alive is a perfect example of what a morally bad yet low chaos option looks like. He is a horrible person, at least how he is presented here in the first game, but keeping him alive is objectively better for the city as a whole. The other two side objectives in this mission are meaningless, but for completion's sake, I'll briefly go over them. One involves rescuing a Bottle Street gang member named Alec, who promises to split a stash of pearls with you. He leads you through the map before ultimately betraying you. There are also no differences whether you have high or low chaos, this is just what always happens. The other mission involves helping a woman who has been trapped by a swarm of rats. This in theory circles back to the idea taught to players during the tutorial, using bodies to distract the swarms. However, I found it was always easier and faster to just stand slashing at the rats in order to clear them out. This is because the amount of damage they do isn't high enough to offset how quickly you can disperse them. This highlights how inconsequential the rat plague feels in terms of actual gameplay. Compare this to something like A Plague Tale, where simply touching a horde of rats means death. One of that game's greatest strengths, in my opinion, is how tangible the plague feels. It's something you have to constantly deal with, and it always feels extremely deadly. I think Dishonored could benefit from a similar approach. I actually find it funny and a little ironic because A Plague Tale is quite grounded and realistic with everything except for the rats, which almost feels supernatural. Dishonored is the opposite of this in my opinion, where its world is supernatural and fantastical, but the mechanics of the rats feel very grounded. Continuing with the plot, after knocking Sokolov out and carrying him to the boat, you return to the Hound Pits. The following morning, the Admiral and Corvo interrogate Sokolov for what information he has regarding the Lord Regent's financial backer. We know you painted a portrait of the Lord Regent's mistress, the very aristocrat who is funding the military with her fortune. She is the key to the Lord Regent's control over the city, and we must have her name. Sorry, Admiral. I cannot help you. Players are given two methods to get Sokolov talking, the nice option of bribing him with an expensive bottle of brandy, or the presumably high chaos option of releasing a swarm of rats into his holding cell. Both options work, and as is becoming a trend, have no repercussions in the story down the line. Sokolov reveals the Lord Regent's financial backer and mistress is one of three sisters of the Boyle family, although he can't be sure of which of the three siblings it is because he allegedly only painted the woman from the back. Again, this reasoning is incredibly stupid, but we're just going to move past it. The Boyles are having a masquerade party that very evening, and Corvo is going to attend in order to determine which Lady Boyle is the Lord Regent's ally, and then eliminate her. If you've never played Dishonored but have heard it talked about, it's likely been about this level, Lady Boyle's Last Party. It is often cited as many people's favorite mission in the game due to its unique setup and focus on social stealth, where instead of creeping in the shadows, you are instead in disguise, attempting to blend in with others in order to gather information and perform your goal. The other big factor that makes this mission unique is that each playthrough of the mission randomizes which sister is the target, as well as what color she is wearing. The three sisters are Waverly, Lydia, and Yzma, and the possible colors each could be wearing are black, white, and red. 
In this way, there are several potential combinations for your target. Being truthful, I don't love this mission as much as everyone else. I would put it somewhere towards the middle for overall quality of the game's levels, and while it is a change from the format of the other missions, it suffers from large problems that ultimately make the level quite shallow. While initially the mission seems complex, requiring sleuthing and subtly listening to guests' conversations, in reality this is pretty far from the truth. There are only two guests that have any information to offer. Miss White in the Moth Mask will identify which colors each of the Boyle sisters are wearing, and Mr. Brisby in the Frank the Bunny Mask, who will completely solve the entire mystery for you, telling you exactly which sister you're looking for as well as what color she's wearing. Outside of these two characters, you can also discern which sister is the target by one other method, searching each of their rooms on the second story, where one will have a letter next to their diary from the Lord Regent. This will only solve half of the equation, knowing their names, but will still require players to learn which color each sister is in. These are the only methods of determining your target, and none of them are particularly engaging on consecutive playthroughs, given that you immediately know where to find your answers. Along with the lack of options for gathering information, there's also no interesting level-specific options for dealing with your target. Your only methods are killing her using your arsenal of weapons, or pursuing the non-lethal route, which I'll discuss more in a little bit. In the High Overseer level, we could poison Campbell's drink, and with the twins, we could kill Morgan with steam if he was in the steam room. With this level, there's nothing. No making a chandelier fall on Lady Boyle or poisoning her drink. No interacting with the other party guests to perhaps create a fight. No messing with their rooms. Nothing. Having options is what makes a social stealth game fun, as proven by the recent trilogy of Hitman games. Now, I don't think it's fair to fully compare Dishonored to these games because overall they are trying to do different things. However, I do think it's fair to compare this particular mission to the recent Hitman games because it is so very clear that this is the type of design that Arcane was emulating with the Lady Boyle party level. Unfortunately, when you do this comparison, it becomes clear how bare bones and shallow Dishonored's version of social stealth is. Every level in the Hitman series is based around social stealth, featuring multiple ways of getting close to your target, ranging from changing disguises, to listening in on different conversations, to exploring the map thoroughly and finding hidden routes. Each of these options typically involves multiple steps, each also featuring their own problems or hurdles that you need to get past. Most importantly, they often all feel different from each other as well and lead to different conversations and bits of information or lore about the characters. For anyone who likes this particular level in Dishonored and hasn't yet played the new Hitman trilogy, I highly recommend them. Every mission is a scenario like this party only done much better. In fact, it's a trilogy I hope to one day have a video dedicated to on this channel. Now, I can already hear the criticism I'm likely going to get about how it's unfair of me to draw this comparison because Hitman is an entire series based around the concept of social stealth, whereas this is but a single level in Dishonored, and that it's unreasonable to expect a single level to have the same mechanical depth as an entire game based around that concept and gameplay. And I would accept this as a valid criticism, except that in Dishonored's sequel, Arcane essentially does this all over again, basing a single level around a new concept and then throwing it away afterwards. However, the results are much different. I'm going to discuss some gameplay spoilers for a particular mission in Dishonored 2, and for those of you that have yet to play the sequel and would like to be surprised, I've put a timestamp on the screen right now that you can use to skip ahead and avoid the specifics of the level. In the sequel mission, titled A Crack in the Slab, players are given a device that let them time travel between the present and past. The whole level is designed and based around this brand new mechanic of swapping between time periods. And while it does have its own problems, in my opinion this level has the best gameplay usage of time travel ever. 
It is so incredibly well done, and it's honestly crazy that Arcane built this mechanic for just a single level as opposed to the entire game. And it is just for a single level. After you complete that mission, the mechanic is just tossed away. I bring this up because it demonstrates that Arcane is not only an exceptionally talented studio, but also one who will go all out for a concept even if it's only for a single level. And because of this, I don't believe it's unreasonable to hold them to this standard with the Lady Boyle mission, which is half-cooked and not up to the standard set by other games in the social stealth genre. Lady Boyle's party doesn't give enough options for players to tinker with. You either shoot everyone, or you locate Mr. Brisby and have him reveal everything. This also directly leads to several of the other problems that this mission has. Unfortunately, its uniqueness completely breaks down the moment you do anything aggressive at the party. This is rightfully so, but it still quickly turns the mission into a shooting gallery and not even a fun one, as many of the guests don't even run away from you. This has the added consequence of completely removing the challenge of figuring out which of the three Lady Boyles you need to kill. Instead, you just kill them, one at a time, until the mission objective completes through the literal process of elimination. I found this fun to do once for sure, but even this approach feels limited and uninteresting on further playthroughs. At this point, I think it's also a good time to bring up Mr. Brisby himself and the non-lethal route for the mission. It might seem random that this man knows exactly why you're there and who your target is, however it's revealed that he has this information because not only is he a supporter of the Loyalists, but he is also in love with Lady Boyle. Because of this, he doesn't want you to kill her, and he agrees to actually make her disappear if Corvo brings Lady Boyle to him unharmed. I won't harm her, I swear. I'm a man of means. Just bring her to the cellar and I will keep her safe with me. Forever. This is extremely problematic, and I'm frankly shocked that Arcane felt that this was an appropriate non-lethal route to be in the game. I understand that the non-lethal routes are often supposed to be a fate worse than death, but that does not make this okay. We are talking about giving a woman over to a man, presumably a stalker, where she will be held hostage for the rest of her life, and the implications of this are disgusting. Now she'll live out her days. Month after month, year after year, far away, even as her fine clothes wear into tatters and her silken hair gets dull and gray. Plenty of time for reflection. You'll never know how happy you've made me. Someday she'll learn to appreciate me. After all, she'll have her whole life. Additionally, the nature of Lady Boyle's alliance with the Lord Regent isn't as clear-cut as it might initially appear. You can't imagine who I'm seeing. I mean, if people only knew. But I'm only doing it to ensure the family name. It's too dangerous right now not to have proper connections. Truthfully, if I could get free of him, I would. You're more my type. Similar to the Pendleton twins, we aren't presented a clear enough picture of Lady Boyle to make eliminating her feel entirely necessary. Not that that even truly matters, because this is not an appropriate or fitting non-lethal punishment for any crime. No one deserves this, villain or not, and it shouldn't be in the game. A small nitpick to add on top of this, because why not, but how does Lord Brisby even get his boat into the cellar? Surely this would be locked. There are several ways that Arcane could have built a more fitting non-lethal option for Lady Boyle, with the obvious answer being that it could be centered on her family's wealth. Maybe this could have been a more classic thief-style level, where you need to break into their safe and specific rooms in order to steal items that are important to their reputation and wealth. This would leave them in ruin and unable to continue financing the Lord Regent. An alternative idea, or maybe in combination with the previous one, could be centered on something like placing an occult object in her room and then informing the overseers. This in particular would be a cool option because it could only be available if players have a rune and are willing to sacrifice it. This also could have worked narratively because in this very level we are informed that Martin, our ally at the Hound Pits pub, has been elected as the High Overseer. 
There could have been an overseer on the inside that was there to help us, and this would also explain why you can use your outsider powers in front of the overseers in the manor and they don't seem to care. It's certainly a nitpick, but it doesn't make sense as it is why they don't react to me using my powers, especially because many of the other guests do. I'm not a level designer, so I don't know, but the non-lethal route should have been something that doesn't make me feel repulsive afterwards. The final problem that this mission has is that it is quite small, likely the smallest level outside of the Hound Pits pub. There's the Boyle Estate, the surrounding street and canal, and just two other mostly empty buildings you can explore. There's just not much to do when compared to missions like the High Overseer and the Golden Cat. There's only one side objective, and it's to deliver a letter to a Lord Shaw from Trevor Pendleton. This leads to a pistol duel with the Lord, and that's fine, but that's also it. You just shoot or sleep dart him, and it's over. Using any other powers result in the guards attacking you. Within this mission, it would have been cool to use the different lords and ladies in deeper ways to further your mission. Tied into this, the levels would have benefited quite a bit from adding another area on the map, and with this being the estate district, a natural addition could have been some of the other guests' mansions. This could have allowed for a wider range of options centered on the different noble families, doing favors for or against the different families in order to sway their allegiance. On top of this, this level could have potentially been a playground with the leveled up version of the possession ability, allowing you to pose as the different lords and ladies, having conversations or unlocking specific doors. Again, these are just my own ideas as an armchair game developer, and I'm sharing them to illustrate how lacking this mission really is. Now, reading back through this section, I realize how extremely negative I sound about this mission, and I want to clarify that I don't mean to. I do think this mission should be commended for its setup, even if it doesn't quite reach its potential. The first time playing through the mission is pretty incredible, which is likely why many people rank it so high. I'm also not an artist, so I don't feel qualified to critique the specific art design, but I will say that I personally really enjoyed the aesthetic of the manor. The unique masks that several of the guests wear are also all remarkably creepy designs. They stand out and give these minor characters personality, even if it doesn't mean anything. Along with this, I'm impressed how many options Arcane actually gives players to get onto the estate as well as into the party. There are vents from a nearby abandoned building that players can use. You can pick up an invitation from a guest after she loses it, or use an invitation from the art dealer Mr. Bunting if you grabbed it two missions ago while inside his safe. Both of these options allow you to present the invitation to the guards and just be let onto the property. There's an opening in the guard bunkhouse on the estate that can be exploited, with blank being the most obvious option for many routes. You can also access the nearby sewers and enter the manor from the wine cellar. These are all gameplay choices that make infiltration still fun in the subsequent playthroughs. It's clear that a lot of time went into designing the physical space of the estate grounds and the manor. However, similar with the previous mission, the player's chaos level changes almost nothing about this level. There are again more guards, as well as a new enemy type, the stilt-walking tallboys who fire explosive bolts at you, but none of the NPC interactions here change, at least as far as I could find. I feel the need to say that just in case I did miss something, but I feel confident that I didn't. I know it seems like I've kind of beat this to death already, but I think it is important to show how little these systems have actually mattered up to this point. Upon completing the mission and returning to the Hound Pits, however, we do finally start to see the differences in the way the Loyalists are acting, based upon if the player is in high or low chaos. We are moving closer and closer to an empire free of the corrupt and depraved. Not much further now, Corvo. Blood's been flowing in the streets. The storm drains are running red. No point in holding back now, huh? I wish I had a fraction of your skills. I did, years gone by. If the crews of whaling ships continue getting infected, we may run low on whale oil. And without that, we will enter a very dark age. There is word that raiders on the outskirts of the city have become more and more brazen in their raids. Gangs inside, raiders outside. What a world.
This is the first time in the game where your allies have changes in their dialogue based on your chaos levels. So that also makes this the first point where players are shown that their chaos level has an impact on their allies as well. These do feel more impactful than some of the dialogue changes we've gotten in previous missions, and while it is great that these differences exist, some of them, like Martin's comment about the streets running red with blood, could have been shown to us through one of the missions, as opposed to just told to us. Arcane likely chose this point in the game to show differences in your allies' outlook, given how seemingly close we are to our end goal. Admiral Havelock and Martin reveal that having removed all of his allies, it is now time to go after the man himself, the Lord Regent Hiram Burroughs. Samuel ferries Corvo back to Dunwall Tower, the location from the opening of the game where Empress Jessamine was assassinated. It's quickly apparent how much has changed, with many newly installed security measures all around the tower, as well as advanced guard units such as the tall boys we were introduced to in the previous mission. Having to deal with these different enemy types in combination with all of the security technologies makes this level quite good. Players have likely collected enough runes by this point in the game in order to have a wide range of powers to choose from when planning their routes, and so this creates many options. This mission is one of the few in my opinion where taking the guns blazing action approach felt just as fun as the sneaking non-lethal one, even on repeat playthroughs. The level space itself is divided into three areas, with the first being the outside region surrounding the tower. From a design standpoint, I think this is actually the weakest portion of this level. There isn't much to this area other than making your way through the various security measures towards the tower. I think at face value this is actually fine, however, where we get the fly in the ointment is in the waterworks area to one side of the tower that features a disgruntled engineer that you can chat with. First off, I think this was actually a really clever way of adding non-hostile NPCs to this mission. You are assaulting the fortified stronghold of the Lord Regent, so it wouldn't make sense for there to be many non-military or City Watch individuals here. But it does make sense that the staff that work at the tower are here. The problem is that I wish more would have been done with this concept. Perhaps you could find servants that are still loyal to Corvo and they open up secret routes for you. These interactions could even be tied to the previous choices you've made or to the chaos system. Maybe one NPC helper is available if you're only in low chaos, citing that you saved their family member or something. Another could be just for high chaos, maybe this disgruntled engineer. He could open up a water passage into the tower or even the rooftop in exchange for you agreeing to wreak havoc inside. Or maybe it could have nothing to do with these systems and simply just be more options to progress through the level. To be fair, Arcane half-heartedly attempts to do this with the engineer as it is. Just use that valve to open the moat overflow gate. You can get access to the tower's main doors from there. Oh, watch out for the hagfish. I've seen him take a finger off. However, the end result is hardly useful, as it just opens a shortcut to the moat which is already extremely close by. This interaction for me ended up highlighting that this outside area is entirely geared towards either an assault or stealthing, and that there weren't many opportunities for entering the tower in unique ways. The three routes that are available are the front door, the ventilation shaft, and the animal vent that is accessible by possessing a hagfish. Unfortunately, all three of these routes lead you into the foyer of the tower, meaning you will always start the next area in roughly the same location. The other two locations of this level are centered on the inside of Dunwall Tower, as well as the rooftop safe house. These two areas are much better in my opinion, with the later safe house area being essentially optional in a low chaos playthrough. The interior of the tower is where this mission really shines. The space is meticulously crafted with an almost labyrinth of halls and different rooms. Additionally, the inside features a fair number of runes, a bone charm, as well as an important weapon upgrade. Collecting all of these requires that the player explore the whole space, unlike, say, Sokolov's mansion. On top of that, there's also an optional side objective for players to complete that involves dealing with the royal torturer in the basement of the tower. 
There isn't much to this side objective, especially if you are playing a non-lethal playthrough as there's no unique ways of dealing with him. This is a bit of a missed opportunity in my opinion given that this was the man who was torturing Corvo for a confession while he was imprisoned. There should be some sort of satisfying way of dealing with him. Story-wise, your primary objective is to eliminate the Lord Regent, and for this, the game actually makes an effort to give players consequences based on their current chaos level. If you've played the game violently up to this point, murdering your targets and any who stood in your way, then the Lord Regent's paranoia has come to a head. He suspects the assassin is coming for him and as such has locked himself in his safe room located at the very top of Dunwall Tower. This requires players to make their way through the entire tower in order to reach the heavily fortified safe room. In contrast, if players enter this level with low chaos, then the Lord Regent is confident in his security force and sees little reason to leave the comfort of his personal chamber. This simple change in his location makes the mission actually play differently, unlike say abducting Anton Sokolov or going after High Overseer Campbell, both of whom are always in their singular designated location despite any actions you the player have made in the current mission or missions prior. More levels would have benefited from changeups like this. In regards to the Lord Regent, there are also some cool, missable actions that Arcane snuck into this level. When you enter the foyer for the first time, you will witness a military general talking to the Lord Regent on a primitive video feed. If you interrupt this conversation and kill the guards, you are actually able to engage in conversation with the Regent himself, even revealing your identity to him. Alternatively, if the Lord Regent is in his safe house, you can get a similar scene, but face to face. For the love of Dunwall, how? How did you get to me? No, it's impossible. An hallucination. My eyes see what they fear. Why do you hide your face? Are you some phantom behind that mask? Some terrible spirit here to punish me for my lack of perfection? What do you intend to do? I must know! Are you even capable of mercy? Corvo! <gasps> How is it even possible? My mind reels. These were easily missable, especially on a stealth playthrough, but were welcome additions that Arcane didn't have to include but chose to, even knowing that a subset of their players would never see them. Now speaking of missable, I want to discuss what I consider the fatal flaw of this mission, and unfortunately it's the non-lethal route. As an alternative to killing Hiram Burroughs, you are given the option of exposing his crimes by playing his recorded confession over the broadcasting system. If I explain, then you will see I am not at fault. My poverty eradication plan was meant to bring prosperity to the city, to rid us of those scoundrels who waste their days in filth and drink without homes or occupations other than to beg for the coin for which the rest of us toil. And it was a simple plan. Bring the disease-bearing rats from the Pandician continent and let them take care of the poor for us. The plan worked perfectly at first. But the rats, oh, it was as if they sought to undo me. They hid from the catchers and bred at a sickening rate. Soon it didn't matter. Rich, poor, all were falling sick. And then people began to ask questions. The Empress assigned me to investigate whether the rats had been imported by a foreign power. I knew the truth would come out eventually, so there was no other way than to be rid of her and take power myself. She had to die, you see. She had to die. This is broadcast all over the city as well, revealing the Lord Regent's treachery to all, and after playing the confession, you can actually witness him getting arrested by members of the City Watch. I order you to put down your weapons! This is treason! It's over, Hiram. Your head will roll for what you've done. No! I'll make you rich men if you just let me go. I beg you! This is not only incredibly satisfying to watch, but also a thematically fitting non-lethal method of dealing with him given his crimes. So having said that, you might be confused then as to why I consider it to be this mission's largest problem. Well, there are three big problems tied to it, and I'll start with the smallest one first. 
The game opens with Corvo having been sent to different countries in order to gather information about this rat plague, and it's revealed no other countries have seen or dealt with it before. I hope that one of the other cities had dealt with this before, knew of some cure. This news is very bad. We're at the breaking point. As you progress through the story, it's clear that the plague's origin is a mystery, even to the scientific community of the city. Obviously, the plague rat is distinct from the ordinary rat, but in what respect? Its size and the coarseness of its fur, and I believe in intelligence, although the experiments there are not complete. Coriander Zoological Survey describes only the ordinary rat, which means plague rats have only been here for five or seven years at most. This was not a gradual migration. Could they have been introduced on purpose? Perhaps by a foreign power. I would consider solving this mystery as one of the main driving forces of the story outside of eliminating the Lord Regent and his allies. If you are playing a High Chaos playthrough, then there is a chance that you will not learn the plague's origin, which is very unsatisfying narratively. This is more than a bit frustrating, and perhaps there could have been some option to listen to or read the confession prior to broadcasting it, which actually leads into the second issue I have. The process of learning that the confession exists and then acquiring it is incredibly shallow. The man behind the broadcast inform you of the confession as well as the combination to the safe it is kept in. Ignoring that it's strange for this man to know all of this, and ignoring that it doesn't make sense that the Lord Regent would even keep an incredibly damning confession like this around, the problem is that this non-lethal route is too easy. We were asked to carry High Overseer Campbell through the entire abbey in order to reach the Heretics brand, and we had to complete multiple side objectives for Slackjaw in order for him to agree to take care of the Pendleton twins, but here it's as simple as unlocking a safe and that's it. I think an expansion to this process would have been good, maybe requiring players to physically record his confession themselves as he said it out loud. Or alternatively, maybe there could be some scenario that involved possessing or tricking the royal torturer into interrogating the Lord Regent, ultimately getting his confession out of him. This would allow these three characters to come full circle from the prologue. Finally, the last problem is the largest, that this non-lethal route of exposing what the Lord Regent did would undoubtedly lead to high chaos for the city, not lower chaos. Seriously, think about what he says in this confession. The man currently acting as the ruler reveals that not only did he have the previous empress assassinated, but he is personally responsible for the rat plague, and that he brought the rats in as a means of killing poor people. There would be chaos, a portion of the population would lose faith in the government and that would likely never be recoverable, you'd have groups that refuse to believe in Burroughs' crime despite the literal confession, Noble families such as the Pendletons and the Boyles who came into extensive power due to the Lord Regent would likely be vocal supporters that he was framed. There is no shot that Corvo and the Loyalists managed to put Emily on the throne after something like this. The whole system would be burned to the ground. With this to consider, assassinating Hiram Burroughs should have actually been the low chaos option. As the Loyalists, you frame the masked vigilante as the assassin, but that Emily Caldwin is luckily still alive. They then step up to help her rule, hunting down the assassin Dowd after saying that he is the masked vigilante, and then pardoning Corvo. I really don't think you can hear what I just described and still believe that the chaos system as it was implemented is anything more than a binary morality system. Arcane's philosophy in this series is that killing of any kind will lead to more chaos, and I think this particular level and this particular choice shows the fatal flaw of this philosophy. For a claimed chaos system to be novel and effective, it needs to understand that sometimes good men have to do bad things, or otherwise it's just another morality system called by a different name. One final point worth mentioning about this level is the character of General Tobias, who is protecting the Lord Regent. He is given a unique name and his own chambers, which makes it seem like he's going to have some significance, but it turns out that he doesn't, at least not really. I'm not sure if he was going to have more of a role in this mission, but he acts as a little more than just another guard. Because of this, this character should have been swapped for Jeff Kernow, the guard captain from the High Overseer level. 
This would have made for interesting potential in playthroughs where you saved him with either having to work around him or maybe getting help from him. It just seems strange to me that the decision was made to introduce yet another unique character for this one level when we already have a connection to another character who could have had the exact same role. With this, we return to the Hound Pits pub to find a celebration. The Lord Regent and his allies are taken care of, and so it is done. Tonight, rest easy. Tomorrow, we crown an empress. To Corvo, the man who served to change the course of history. To Emily Cole, and the new dawn rising for Dunwall and the Empire. Depending on if players explore the Hound Pits before going to the celebration, they might get clued in that not everything is as it seems. This was never my idea. He knows that. Certainly I am not completely guiltless, but with my position, he would be a fool to come for me. And if he does, I have much to offer. It won't be long now. Barring some unfortunate turn of events or betrayal, I will soon have a very astonishing title. The celebration is for the loyalists having accomplished their goals, but this party feels very different depending on the player's chaos level. Word is spreading all over the city. The tyranny is over. By this time tomorrow, Emily will be on the throne. After that, we'll clear your name and put everything we've got into rebuilding the city. The armed forces will do their job. Martin has control of the overseers, and you, Trevor. Do whatever it is you do with part. That's Lord Trevor Pendleton to you. Without me, you'll never command the nobility. They'll tear you apart like a fish. She'll need higher mathematics, court protocol, and cosmology, of course. Do you provide these things? Of course not, no. I just think I should have a central role. Emily comes She first. trusts me. It's true, she does. Perhaps you ought to send her to me, and soon. She is a spoiled child, so even if she's to be an empress. Well, there's always work in Every optional line of dialogue during this party sequence changes depending on whether you are in high or low chaos, and these were just a few examples because showing all of them would have added 20 minutes to the already excessive runtime of this video. The differences in the conversations that occur here are substantial and change the feeling of the scene. In low chaos, it's not quite cheerful, but it is hopeful. I swear I'll help you find the murderer who struck down the Empress. Your life will be changed very soon. Versus in high chaos, everyone seems on edge, but now also are showcasing the worst aspects of their personalities. One thing I'll say for the region, he kept the commoners out of our business. We do all this work, all this risk, so that a child can assume leadership of an empire in chaos. I give us very slim odds. All of us. Giving credit where credit is due, this was very well implemented, but it also should have been this substantial for the majority of the game. As you've been watching these scenes, you may have noticed a hazy green wave spread across the screen and even distort the audio. After the toast during the cutscene, this effect begins happening on your screen every couple of minutes, further indicating that something is not quite right. During my first playthrough, which was low chaos, this genuinely came as a surprise, and while I immediately knew right after that I was going to be betrayed, it didn't make it any easier to swallow. As you enter into your room in the attic, you collapse and learn that you have been poisoned by the very men you have been working with. Samuel, you move like you've been drinking. Did the poison work its magic? Is he dead? It better have worked. It cost me a month's profit. Yes, sir. I believe Corvo has breathed his last. Just as you wanted. You've done a fine job, then. Remember, we need the body. If we come forward with the corpse of the man who murdered the Empress, we'll be greeted as heroes. Yes, it'll grant us legitimacy. We'll be the men who rescued Emily and brought down the Lord Regent and his assassin. Narratively, the Loyalists have now succeeded in their goals of taking down the Lord Regent, but arrive at a new problem. The realization that everything they have done up to that point has been treason. They broke the individual charged with murdering the previous Empress out of prison and ordered him to assassinate a High Overseer, two members of Parliament, a noblewoman, and a Lord Regent. 
As I said at the beginning of this video, Corvo is to act as the knife in their plans, but what do they do once there's no longer a need for the knife? While Corvo might still be useful as a protector, he also has a massive influence on Emily. And from the point of view of the Loyalist leaders, this is very problematic, especially for their own agendas. Do you know Emily is quite special? She learned from all of us, you especially. She trusts you absolutely, I believe. Not to mention their likely growing fear that they themselves wouldn't be safe from Corvo if he didn't agree with their motives. This leads the trio to consider a different use for Corvo, as a body that will cement their place not as traitors but instead as patriots who have a legitimate claim to the regency. Samuel poisons Corvo on their orders, but once they are alone, he reveals to him that he only gave him half the dosage. I'm sorry something terrible, Corvo, but I only gave you half the poison. They were watching me and it was all I could think to do. I think you're strong enough to survive that. I'll put you on a raft, and then I've got to ship out myself, before they find out I've got against their wishes. Snakes. They'll want to do the same to me as soon as I've outlived my uses. It impresses me how well this singular plot twist works for both high and low chaos. Within high chaos, Havelock, Pendleton, and Martin are all vying for power. They betray Corvo and the other members of the Loyalists, as well as ultimately each other. One of the themes of the game is power corrupts, and this whole outcome reflects that. In Low Chaos, their betrayal is more out of paranoia and fear, but also mirrors the regency they just took down. Hiram Burrow and his allies used Dowd to secure the regency for themselves, and the Loyalists used Corvo in the same way for the same reason. The irony is that these three men, Havelock, Pendleton, and Martin, took down the Lord Regent and his allies, but in doing so have become them. Havelock is ruled by paranoia and his desire to control all factors. Martin only controls the overseers due to Campbell's blackmail journal, and Pendleton presumably inherits the problem that his brothers had, that their family silver mines have stopped producing and his wealth is vanishing. They believe that by killing Corvo they grant themselves legitimacy, however they fail to recognize that had they just stayed the course that they were on, they likely would have still ended up in incredibly powerful political positions under Emily as the Empress. It's not unreasonable to assume that these men would have become trusted and valued advisors, but instead they threw it away out of fear or for power. Ironic. Samuel only gives Corvo half the dosage of poison and is then able to sneak him out of the hound pits that evening by sending him down the river on a raft. While this succeeds in getting Corvo away from the Loyalists, in his weakened state he is found and captured by the Whalers, the gang of assassins responsible for murdering the Empress. After his discovery, Corvo is quickly brought before Dowd, the leader of the assassins. He says very little other than that he recognizes the outsider's symbols on Corvo's hand, as well as that he, Corvo, is a mystery. And I know what it felt like to shove a blade into your empress. But I don't know you, who you are, and who you fight for. You're a mystery, and I can't allow that. Dowd tosses all of Corvo's equipment to the bottom of a refinery and then has him imprisoned. This is quite a poor introduction to the character of Dowd in my opinion. His dialogue is written so stilted here and doesn't match to the character we see later in this very level or in the future DLCs that are centered on him. This is the character who we witnessed murder the Empress in the opening of the game, but our first actual conversation with him is essentially him cryptically rambling. During this scene, Dowd frankly seems stupid, given that he just throws Corvo's equipment away, despite how mechanically unique and expertly built it is. And even more mind-boggling is that he imprisons Corvo the way that he does, despite knowing that he has powers from the Outsider just like himself. And we know that this was his orders, because outside of your holding cell, you can find a document that details the gang's plans to ransom Corvo back to Havelock, who has become the Lord Regent. I want to right out the gate share a change that could have been made to this opening cutscene that would have helped build a stronger narrative beginning to this level. 
For this introduction to Dowd, my change is a simple one. Just remove this scene entirely and have Corvo wake up in the prison cell after being found by the two whalers on the river. Or alternatively, make it occur with a second-in-command assassin, someone like Billy Lurk. I know that Billy likely wasn't thought up as a character until the DLCs, but it could have been any assassin because that character ultimately doesn't really matter. This would allow for an introduction to the Whalers and still have Corvo's equipment dumped, but these decisions would reflect on this assassin as opposed to Dowd. There could even be a conversation added between them later where Dowd chastises the assassin's stupidity in handling the situation given Corvo's powers. This change would also make our first interaction with Dowd himself be the confrontation that occurs later this mission. That encounter is more memorable, and while not perfect, it's still much better. After escaping your makeshift prison cell, you are quickly introduced to the last new enemy type in the game, the Whaler Assassins. They differentiate themselves, or at least try to, by having access to supernatural abilities. Specifically, they have two abilities that are all about closing the distance between them and you. One pulls you towards them, and the other is a quick teleportation that puts them near you. I do have some critiques on their design, but I'll discuss them as well as the rest of the enemies in the game in much more detail during the combat portion of this video. The Whalers operate out of an area called the Flooded District. In documents found throughout the area, players can learn that the actual name for the location is the Rudshore Financial District, and that it used to be home to many commercial businesses such as whale oil refining and a chamber of commerce. The area was flourishing until one of the barriers holding back the river collapsed and flooded a large portion of the district, which ultimately led to it being abandoned. Because of this, the area began getting used as both a quarantine zone for those infected with the plague and a dumping ground for bodies. This background lore pairs nicely with the infected and condemned feeling that the district wears visually. I want to repeat that I'm not an artist, and so I don't feel qualified to critique the specifics of the art direction. However, in my amateur opinion, this is the level that stands out the most visually to me. The use of green and turquoise colors throughout the entire level is something I found quite striking and uniquely different from any of the other spaces we visit over the course of the game. Additionally, there's a space towards the end of the mission which features a bloodied whale carcass. It and the surrounding area lean into the occult and creepy atmosphere we see much more of in the future games, and I think this is to its benefit. This level is also quite large, consisting of four areas, each not only well designed but also containing an objective for the player to complete. The first section is the Rudshore Waterfront, where players begin the mission. It's centered on the various flooded streets and rooftops of the surrounding buildings. This section also contains the Greaves Whale Oil Refinery, which is the location from the mission's opening cutscene where Dowd dumped all of Corvo's equipment. Retrieving your equipment is an optional objective here, and it truly is optional. It's possible to complete the remainder of the game without your weapons, or any weapons for that matter. To collect them, Corvo must descend into the refinery's lower floors, which, depending on a choice players made earlier in the game, sets up different encounters. If players killed High Overseer Campbell back in the second mission, then the entire interior of the building has become a staging ground for Weepers, and as such, there are many for Corvo to deal with. If players use the Heretic brand on Campbell, he can be found on the ground floor instead, branded and now a Weeper himself. In terms of differences, this is a small and largely insignificant one. Despite that though, it still is memorable for me. Seeing High Overseer Campbell as a Weeper makes it feel like your decision earlier actually mattered in the world, even if functionally it doesn't change much. Speaking of Overseers, throughout the waterfront you can find many dead ones, who appear to have been ambushed and outsmarted by the assassins. Notes accompanying the bodies indicate that they were sent to the flooded district on the orders of High Overseer Campbell in an attempt to kill the assassin group. This is obviously prior to Corvo dealing with Campbell himself. I bring this up because the actions of this assault against the assassins represents yet another similarity between the former Lord Regent and the Loyalists. The Overseers were sent in to wipe out Dowd and his assassins on High Overseer Campbell's orders, but it's fair to take that one step farther and say that Campbell himself was likely acting on Lord Regent Burroughs' orders. 
The Lord Regent was paranoid and would no doubt have wanted to tie up any loose ends that could connect him to the assassination of the Empress, which includes eliminating the knife in his plan, Dowd. This mirrors the actions and mindset of the Loyalists when they betray Corvo, as he is the only one who could testify to their actions being treason. The second area of this mission is the best, and is centered on the Rudshore Chamber of Commerce building. This is where the Whalers have built their base of operations, and the objective is to confront the assassin Dowd and get his keys to the sewers in order to escape the flooded district. The layout of the surrounding area is quite complex, with many patrolling whalers and only two ways into the commerce building. And this leads us to Dowd. So you've lost it all. Ruined at last. Lord Regent. Royal Spy Master. Hiram Burroughs. You small, worried man. You'll never know how many times I've thought about trying to get close to you again. Just to put a piece of sharp metal in your eye. But now there's no need. You've been taken down by the same apparatus that gave you life to begin with. Laws and courtrooms and the mighty swell of public outrage. Good riddance to you, sir. So many schemes you had, and so many contracts. How many people did I kill for you? None like the last. None like her. I'd give back all the coin if I could. No one should have to kill an empress. I want to start by emphasizing that Doubt is very likely my favorite character in the Dishonored series, but unfortunately that comes almost entirely from the two expansions that are centered on him. I'll be discussing those expansions in their own video, but I felt it was important to say this because I don't think we see enough of Dowd's story arc or character growth in this game for him to be considered an anti-hero, redemptive, or even an interesting character. It is told to us that he regrets being a part of the conspiracy to murder the Empress and kidnap her daughter Emily, but by that same standard he still proceeds to fight Corvo even in low chaos. After the fight, he asks for mercy, which is the non-lethal route for this target, and he monologues about the choices he's made. I ask for my life. When I killed your empress and took her daughter, something broke inside me. Now I see the design on the back of your hand, the mark of the outsider himself, and I remember all I've done. The years of waiting for the right moment to step forward from an alley and drive a knife between the ribs of some noble. All the money exchanging hands from one rich bastard or another. Killing for one of them one year, then being paid to kill him in return the next. But what have I accomplished? More than you have, or much less. I remember bending at the shrines, listening as the outsider whispered that I was going to change things, that I was somehow important. It felt good. It made me believe I was powerful. Now I want nothing but to leave this city and fade from the memory of those who reside here. I've had enough killing. But again, this is only after he attempts to kill Corvo in a duel, so how regretful and sorry can he actually be? And to be clear, he starts this fight as well, you are not given the option to approach him and talk before the fight. Because of this, his declaration that he has more or less changed and now just wants to simply leave the city seems a little hollow and again like bad writing. Combine this with the realization as well that he captured Corvo at the beginning of this mission with the intention of turning him over to Lord Regent Havelock in exchange for money. Dowd is supposed to be a reflection of Corvo, both were chosen by the outsider and granted abilities, both were used by those in power to topple a ruler, and both were betrayed afterwards by those same people, all of which in theory is the reason for potentially sparing him. However, we are not shown enough of a Dowd who recognizes all of this and regrets his actions. So because of that, it would be incredibly stupid for Corvo to allow the deadly supernatural assassin who murdered his empress and lover, as we'll soon find out, to simply leave on his word that he's changed. The non-lethal route being to spare him also doesn't even fit with what Arcane seemed to be doing with the non-lethal alternatives, which was dealing out symbolically fitting punishments to each target. 
With this guideline in mind, I feel like a more fitting non-lethal alternative is obvious. Have Corvo cut off Dowd's hand in order to sever his connection to the Void. In addition to him losing his outsider powers, it would also effectively end his entire gang as they only have powers because Dowd shares his. Thematically, this removes the thing that has made Dowd famous and powerful while also removing the thread that holds his makeshift family together. This also just simply makes more sense narratively, as from Corvo's perspective, he leaves them alive, yes, but ends a gang of assassins, which is better for the city as a whole. This action would also remove nothing significant that we see from Dowd in future games while actually adding something interesting for his character, no hand and no powers, essentially killing the character without actually killing them. Now, it is possible to avoid the confrontation with Dowd altogether, sneaking in, grabbing the key, and leaving. In this case, it makes sense to have sparing him be a second non-lethal option. However, I do think that ghosting this level actually robs players of both the only meaningful interaction with Dowd in the game, but also the boss fight against him. And now we fight the duel that no two others could fight against the ticking of the clock. Leave us! I have to do this alone. Another slice out of time, Corvo. I've waited for this. Let's see if the Outsider will save your life, or mine. This fight is one of only two in the game that I think you could consider a boss fight, and because of that, I think Arcane should be commended for making this fight feel different from fights against other standard enemies. Dowd uses powers similar to his assassins, but can also freeze time in the same way Corvo can, stopping enemies and projectiles in their tracks. While his bend time doesn't freeze you in place, likely because you also have the outsider's mark, it does successfully manage to feel like a challenge. It will stop your projectiles in place, allowing Dowd time to avoid them. This is clever and forces the fight to become more of a sword duel. This is who protected the Empress. After acquiring Dowd's key to the sewers, Corvo escapes the flooded district and enters into the third area of this mission, the Rudshore Quarantine Zone. This section is small, but also one of my favorites in the entire game, simply for how graphically it portrays the Rat Plague. You see bodies being dumped from rail carts, tall boys patrolling, and many sick survivors. The area features a secondary objective if you're in low chaos, allowing you to help a group of survivors escape the quarantine zone. While nice in theory, this maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense given that I feel confident saying these civilians are presumably all infected, having spent time in this quarantine zone. So you helping them escape is spreading the plague. <laughs> Traversing this area in high chaos offers some basic changes. The survivors trying to escape are all weepers already, and the whole yard is patrolled by many more tall boys. This segment is meant to be a representation of what the Rat Plague has done to the city, and I wish there were greater differences for this zone depending on if you were in high or low chaos, perhaps vastly different world states. It just feels strange that this quarantine zone is essentially the same, despite my best efforts to not generate chaos in the world. While Corvo isn't able to pass through the Red Shore Gate itself, he is able to enter into the old Dunwall sewer system, which will lead back to the Hound Pits pub. This area is the final section of the level and is quite short. You move through the sewers fighting River Crusts, which are a stationary mollusk enemy that spit acid. While I haven't mentioned them before now, this isn't the first time we see these guys. They are without doubt the most annoying and least engaging enemy type in the game, most likely the entire series. What makes this last area significant is that it potentially features the culmination of the Granny Rags and Slackjaw side plot. I'm going to boil off the nasty fat and sinew and carve a pretty song on your bones. Hey! Someone kill this crazy witch! I could make you rich! Quiet now. Granny needs to concentrate. Don't kill me. 
Granurag, stop! Stop what you're doing! can we at least talk about it? My knives gotta be nice and sharp to cut into your skeleton, Slackjaw. Nice and sharp. There's my love. Are you ready to help get Slackjaw's bones? I say potentially because it is missable and can only happen if you complete at least one of the side objectives for each of the characters. It's also likely that many people will have forgotten about these two by this point in the game, given that they were only present in the beginning missions. It might even come as a surprise that these two are given some sort of finale to their squabble at all, because, well, that's just it, their qualms with each other seemed pretty minor. Slackjaw's men attempted to shake down Granny Rags, and she retaliated by wanting you to poison their bootleg elixir distill. Then, the following mission, Slackjaw sends you out to find his man Crowley, who has been killed, with the implication being that it was Granny Rags. And you'll never believe who it is, either. At first I did. That's why it taken me so long. I wanted to be sure. It's a welcome surprise seeing these two characters again, given that they are two of the most interesting side characters in the game. This scenario also presents an interesting choice to players in that it requires you to get involved and pick a side, the supernatural witch or the brutal gang leader. And it's well done because depending on who you choose, you get a different experience. Siding with Granny Rags requires hardly any effort at all. You kill Slackjaw as he is chained up and unable to defend himself. You then dump his body into the boiling cauldron and afterwards Granny gives you the key to be on your way out of the sewers. Siding with Slackjaw, in contrast, leads to the second of the two boss fights in the game, this one against Granny Rags. Just like Dowd, she is marked by the Outsider, and so similarly she fights with supernatural powers, such as teleportation as well as summoning hordes of rats to attack you. Uniquely, Granny also can't initially be killed, which adds a puzzle to this fight. In her quarters below the dead whale carcass, you can find a journal that gives details on how to make her mortal, requiring players to locate her hidden cameo and then burn it in the furnace. Doing so will then render her finally killable. This fight is fantastic and shows that Dishonored's combat is often at its best when fighting intense one-on-one -on -one encounters against super-powered individuals. Along with this, the whole destroying her horcrux in order to be able to kill her is a nice twist on the format we've gotten used to in this game with the lethal and non-lethal ways of dealing with targets. It makes me want Arcane to build a game specifically around this, where each of your targets has some sort of power and you have to figure out how to uniquely kill each of them. Choosing either Granny Rags or Slackjaw doesn't make a difference in the narrative, with both outcomes still leading to Corvo gaining the keys to exit the sewer and being on his way. Prior to leaving, you pass through a survivor camp, though there's nothing narratively significant about this location or any of the individuals. On Low Chaos, it is full of civilians just trying to survive, and on High Chaos, it has become a weeper infestation. It feels like there should be something more to this area in Low Chaos, even if it was just a black market shop similar to Griff's in the beginning missions. While I do like that there's a difference here, it is again just replacing civilians with weepers, which makes sense because there is a plague, but perhaps this camp could have been more impactful if it was civilians, regardless of the chaos level. Maybe in High Chaos, they could still attack you out of fear and hatred given all of the propaganda about the masked vigilante. This could be unique because now the general population is actively attacking you as well. Continuing on, you quickly exit the sewers and find your way back into the neighborhood containing the Hound Pits pub. This section of the video will encompass the last two missions together, as this mission, the eighth one, doesn't have its own assassination target and is essentially set up for the final mission where you take down the Loyalist leadership. The mission starts Corvo in the basement of one of the vacant houses neighboring the pub, with him having found his way there from the door near the sewer. One of the servants from the Hound Pits, Cecilia, is present, and she quickly informs him of what has transpired since he disappeared. At first, Pendleton said it was time for our bonus. Havelock stood behind them, and at the signal, he shot them each in the back of the head. Just like the target drills he used to. Lydia barely had time to scream. I would be dead too. Except Wallace told me I wouldn't be getting anything. Pendleton kept apologizing, saying that no one could ever know about the things they'd done. 
Martin was drinking and seemed sad. The Admiral was about to shoot Callista. Then he mumbled something about owing her uncle, Captain Kurnow, a debt. This is the low chaos version of this opening conversation, with the main difference in high chaos being that Callista is also brutally killed with the rest of the servants. As players exit the building into the street, they are greeted by a very different environment surrounding the pub. Members of the city watch discussing their orders, and tall boys are patrolling the streets. Corvo's goal is to determine the location of Emily and the Loyalists, as well as see if any of his allies still live. This level's biggest success is that it attempts to turn a location that players should be intimately familiar with by this point, the Houndpits pub, into a hostile zone, requiring players to utilize their knowledge of the space to outmaneuver their enemies, much in the same way that Corvo himself would need to within the context of the story. Unfortunately, to this end, it's not as successful as it could be. The level largely allows players to sidestep this entire challenge by completing a side objective during the mission. Corvo can find the two natural philosophers, Piero and Sokolov, locked down in the workshop, and after greeting them, they reveal their designs for a new arc pylon, one with a wider radius and the ability to render enemies unconscious rather than killing them. After obtaining the discarded blueprints from Havelock's old quarters, you can activate the device and it deals with all of the enemies at the Hound Pits pub at once. Now, maybe I'm just being a complainer, but this is simply too easy. In terms of using lethality or not, the choice here is ludicrous. And listen, I don't mean to be all in your ear, talking a whole bunch of shit that you ain't trying to hear, but this choice isn't actually a choice. It's just selecting either option one of removing all enemies lethally, or option two of removing all enemies non-lethally. They play exactly the same, except one adds bodies to the end of mission tracker. You, the player, don't have to do anything differently or work any harder to achieve non-lethal with this choice. In fact, in a high chaos playthrough, it's more rewarding and more fun to just kill all the enemies yourself. Completing it this way even leads to a funny and missable conversation with Piero. All of the guards have been dispatched already? I spend weeks building a machine to do something you can do in a matter of minutes. I thank you for showing me the inefficiency of my process. The intention with this whole side objective is likely to demonstrate the power these two characters have when they are working together. There is value in this, however I think that there could have been an actual interesting choice here for players to make, one that really challenges them. What if there was no new arc pylon at all, and instead players had to deal with the enemies themselves in order to rescue the two scientists? This would be made especially interesting because there is not a way to non-lethally deal with the tall boys. So do players choose to rescue these two characters they have connections with and who will likely be instrumental in battling back the plague, but to do so require them to kill the tall boys? Or do they keep their choice of remaining non-lethal, despite knowing that leaving Piero and Sokolov to their fate is as good as killing them yourself? This choice likely seems unfair or frustrating, but that's exactly the point. Choices should be difficult. There shouldn't be a choice to press this button to non-lethally deal with 17 enemies. I know that I've made many suggestions over the course of this video, and I'm not saying that these are the best possible ones. There's likely a hundred better ones forming from people watching this video. Rather, I'm going through these to illustrate how many options Arcane had when it came to making meaningful choices, and what we got is simply a binary good versus evil system. Now, in order for players to progress to the next mission, they need to complete two tasks. Firstly, determine where the Loyalists have taken Emily, and second, devise a way to get there yourself. The Hound Pits is a small location, and so while there are a few options for figuring out Emily's location, they are limited by the size of the map and its setting. The two options both involve gathering the information from left behind notes. One from Havelock to his men, wherein he issues orders but also reveals his location. The other from Emily, hidden in Corvo's now empty room next to a large drawing she made of him. The drawing of Corvo changes depending on your chaos, but the contents of the note do not, stating that she is on King Sparrow Island, which is a small military installment off the coast of Dunwall. 
With the location now in hand, Corvo learns that a signal flare system was installed in Emily's tower in case of emergencies, and could be a way to signal to Samuel that Corvo has returned. Utilizing the piece of equipment requires gaining access to the tower, of which there is only one way, however that one method changes depending on whether players are in high or low chaos. In low chaos, it's as simple as approaching the door and revealing yourself to Callista, who has been left alive by Havelock. Something changed in the Admiral as soon as the Lord Regent died. It had been building up. Martin was acting strange, going quiet if any of us were near, whispering late into the night with Havelock and Pendleton while you were out doing the real work. I think they realized they were one step away from holding the same position the Lord Regent had, and worried they'd be held accountable for what they did here, as the Loyalists. In High Chaos, Callista was murdered with the other servants, and Corvo must search her corpse for the keys to the tower. These work fine as conclusions to Callista's story, although I think that it's a bit of a stretch that Lord Regent Havelock spares her in the Low Chaos version. He still kills Lydia and Wallace despite them having much less involvement in the Loyalist conspiracy than Callista, who served as Emily's teacher. There's even a conversation between Martin and Callista at the coronation party where he expresses concern that Emily trusts Callista more than the rest of them. Of course not, no. I just think I should have a central role. Emily comes She first. trusts me. It's and true, she does, me. but she should trust all of us. Don't you trust me, Callista? The in-game justification is that Havelock supposedly knew her uncle, Jeff Kernow, but I couldn't find anything in-game to actually support this claim other than what is said during this mission. More information in regards to this could have been cut, but as it is, it feels more like the developers couldn't come up with a valid reason that she wouldn't be killed in low chaos, and so they went with this. Upon entering Emily's tower, Corvo fires the signal flare and Sam quickly arrives. There's no way to mess this up or fail. Even launching the flare while there's still enemies present doesn't do anything as Samuel pulls up to the isolated beach on the other side of the tower. With Emily's location in hand, players can advance to the final mission of the game, confronting the Loyalists at the military base on King Sparrow Island. However, before we head into the final mission, I want to finally discuss the Hound Pits pub. As seen throughout this video, Corvo returns to the Hound Pits after each mission, and so the pub serves as the hub level, allowing players to converse with their allies, buy equipment and upgrades, and learn about the world of Dunwall through additional lore books. As a hub, the Hound Pits is the best in the series, although if we're being honest, that has more to do with its lackluster competition rather than its own merits. The best thing about the Hound Pits is its atmosphere and environment. It was always enjoyable for me to explore the location between missions, particularly as new parts became available such as the sewers or the hound fighting cages. That being said, not everything at the location makes sense from a world standpoint. Emily's Tower is the most striking example of a part of the level that doesn't really fit with the bar's setting, and I'm not really sure what it originally was. The interactions with the characters are also lacking. While it was certainly cool to get to know these individuals between missions, often characters would say the same lines regardless of if I was in high or low chaos, sometimes with bizarre outcomes. For example, after the Lady Boyle party mission, almost every character at the pub asks if you had a fun time at the party, even on high chaos after I massacred everyone there. I trust you enjoyed the Boyle's hospitality. I bet you enjoyed yourself over there. I imagine you made that masquerade a lively event. I doubt there will be another high society party that will live up to it. However, without these sections at the home base, I feel confident saying that I wouldn't have cared about any of the members of the Loyalist Conspiracy at all. Something similar to this actually happened with the Doubt expansions. In those, Arcane forwent having a hub between missions in favor of a cutscene and a shop screen. My guess is that this was done so there'd be less downtime, but it also meant that I had zero attachment to the other characters, and the downstream consequences of this was that certain narrative moments felt meaningless, specifically because I didn't care about those side characters. Unfortunately, the Hound Pits is as good a hub as we've gotten with the Dishonored series, as well as with Arcane as a whole, it seems. Arcane Studios is one of the industry best at designing intricate environmental game spaces, so it may come as a surprise that they've yet to master making a truly exceptional hub world. This actually has less to do with their abilities and more to do with the studio's trajectory. 
With releases such as Deathloop and the upcoming Redfall, it appears that Arcane is moving away from the tightly designed linear but semi-open levels in favor of the current industry trend of full open world. Similar to the Doubt expansions, Deathloop features a loadout menu in favor of a hub location that you can explore. And if Redfall contains a hub at all, I'll be surprised since its focus is multiplayer open world, and if it does, my guess is that it'll likely be an empty outpost for you and your co-op squad to select your gear at. This trajectory is a shame, because while the Hound Pits pub wasn't perfect, I feel confident that Arcane could construct a truly amazing hub world if they wanted to, but it appears that they've instead simply just stopped trying. Now with that, let's move on to the game's final mission. This is it, sir. I suspect Havelock Martin and Lord Pendleton landed there a while ago and went into the lighthouse. Knowing them, they're not giving up without a fight. I remember hearing the Admiral and Martin talking about this place as where they'd hold up if they had to. Anybody going in has to breach the fort and the gatehouse, and there's only one way to the top. All I can say is that it's been a pleasure serving with you. Maybe after all this is settled, we'll see each other again. The island is a bloody mess. Looks like they fought. Maybe over Emily, just after they landed. I'll bet the Admiral's got her locked up in the lighthouse somewhere. If Pendleton's lost the first round, he's probably dug in someplace. It's best to drink himself to death. I suspect it's Martin who's got the lighthouse under siege. They turned on each other at last. So the Admiral's power mad, Martin's a snake, and Lord Pendleton is a coward. And you, Corvo. The things you've done, you could be the worst of us. I've seen a lot traveling with you. Now get off my boat. As the final mission in the game, it should be a showcase of all of the choices that players have made. And while I don't think it is completely successful in that regard, it is successful in having meaningful differences, probably the most significantly meaningful differences between high and low chaos in the entire game. Right from the start of this level, it feels different based on your chaos level. The weather and the tone of your ride in with Samuel are different. In High Chaos, he is so disgusted with you that he fires into the air to alert the guards to your presence. Versus in Low Chaos, it's a nice goodbye and good luck. This level technically has three different openings, one for low chaos, one for high, and one for a medium in between, however the medium chaos version offers no real differences from the high chaos version, except that Samuel doesn't alert the guards in the opening. We'll get to the specifics of these differences in a few moments, but I want to explain the location for this mission. It's divided into one and a half areas, and I say half because one of them, the lighthouse portion at the end, serves more as a final confrontation with the loyalists than as a true area to explore. Even this is being generous because the remaining area is much simpler than any of the other spaces we've seen in the game, and due to this being the final level, there isn't much incentive to explore. To be clear, I'm not counting this as a negative against the level. The game is over after this and it makes sense for this to be a more streamlined level. That being said, I think each of the Dishonored games released after this have done a much better job of making the final level a space to explore regardless of the game coming to a close. Each of those games' final missions also feel larger and more involved than this one's as well. The majority of this level is centered on the King Sparrow Fort. Samuel drops Corvo off on the beach outside of the fort, leaving him to figure out a way inside. The region outside of the fort is well protected, featuring every city guard type enemy as well as all forms of the Sokolov security technology. There are high numbers of patrolling guards, watchtowers, arc pylons, and overseers wielding music boxes. There are two gates that lead inside, one along the beach and another along the cliffs, however both are protected by a wall of light security device. These can be disengaged by finding the control room or even freezing time and walking past. Additionally, there is a way into the fort through a storm drain as well as a clever method requiring Blink to utilize the wall support cables. 
Once inside the fort, Corvo must make his way towards the base of the lighthouse, which contains an elevator that will take him up for the potential final confrontation with the Loyalists. I say potential final confrontation because the encounter with the Loyalists can actually play out in two different ways in two different locations, depending on the player's chaos levels. This is the meaningful differences I referenced when I began talking about this mission. These differences ultimately lead to the same outcome, which you'll be able to see for yourself once we begin discussing them. However, they do help establish a different feeling for this mission should players engage with the differences. Upon entering into the fort on High Chaos, you can witness Overseer Martin and Pendleton yelling at each other, and Corvo can even interrupt this conversation. <laughs> Corvo, alive and well. Somehow I knew it. I suspected you'd show up here for the final fight over Emily. Poor girl. Mm. Such a pawn. <laughs> Excellent. Not so proud anymore, are you, Martin? Go get him, Corvo! In High Chaos, it shows that the leaders of the Loyalists quickly turned on each other in order to gain the most power. Admiral Havelock, who is absent from this squabble, was the quickest, having taken Emily to the top of the lighthouse before locking it down. Players are given the choice of dealing with both Pendleton and Martin if they would like. If you confront Martin while he's alone, he will hold a gun to his head, explain their motives, and then eventually pull the trigger. Pendleton is already dying, having been shot in the gut. He hurls insults and mocks Corvo right up until he dies. I knew you would get here. <laughs> Well, you're too late. I'm already dying without your help. A stray bullet. I'll never know whose. What could I offer you anyway? You want money? Well, I'm broke. Women, maybe? Everyone knows you were screwing the Empress. You like noble women. You should meet my cousin Celia. <laughs> Both of these individuals will die, either by the player's hand or by the methods I described, and while it is possible to knock Martin unconscious instead, neither he nor Pendleton will have any further part to play in the narrative. This then leads to Lord Regent Havelock. As you make your way through the lighthouse on High Chaos, it's empty. There's a trail of blood that leads you higher and higher until you eventually locate the Lord Regent holding Emily as a hostage, preparing to jump from the ledge. This situation leads to one of two outcomes, either Corvo manages to save Emily, or he doesn't, which in turn leads to small differences in the ending. There are a number of options for dealing with this scenario as well, with most leading to the pair falling, but with Emily grabbing the ledge, allowing Corvo to save her. My favorite way of handling the scenario was using upgraded possession on Havelock, which allows Emily to run away. While this certainly was cool, not every tool at your disposal leads to outcomes that make realistic sense. For example, throwing a grenade and somehow Emily can survive this, but that's more of a nitpick. The witnessed violence of the High Chaos ending contrasts against what happens in Low Chaos. Neither Pendleton nor Martin are present in the Kingsbarrow Fort, and are instead in the lighthouse along with Lord Regent Havelock. As you approach, you find Martin and Pendleton slumped over bodies at the meeting table, with Havelock ominously staring into the fire, reciting his thoughts. I know Corvo's coming for me, just like he came for the others. Crossing the island below like it was nothing. The only question is how and when. I'm lacking a counter move. It's all fallen apart. Havelock and his paranoia poisoned the other Loyalist leaders, and while there's nothing to be done for them now, players are free to engage Havelock however they see fit. There's even an extra conversation between Corvo and Havelock that players likely won't see if they are doing a stealth ghost playthrough. This is yours. The key to Emily's cell. She'll be glad to see you. You made quite an impression on her. Did you know that? She asked about you constantly. Where you were. What you'd been doing. I told her. In the end, I told her everything. From the start, when we had such noble goals in mind. To the end, when we were afraid, fighting in secrecy about who we could trust and who we had to kill. Arguing over who would act as new Lord Regent. Similar to the conversations you can have with the Lord Regent Burroughs, as well as with Dowd, I like that these exist, despite many players likely never seeing them. Once players have dealt with Havelock, they can get the key to Emily's room and rescue her. 
as I mentioned a bit ago, these scenarios, with the exception of the path where Emily dies, all lead to the same outcome. Emily is rescued and the loyalists are taken care of. And I think it might be tempting to ask how this is any different from those two overseers killing their sick brother during the second mission at the office of the high overseer. In both scenarios, neither the level itself nor the overall outcomes are changed, it's just the flavoring. What makes this carry more weight is because it isn't just nameless NPCs, but rather characters we have spent time interacting with and have gotten to know. And again, circling back, this is why the Hound Pits as a hub base is so important, because without it, these characters killing each other would have meant very little. Having your choices create very real impacts on characters we have connections to is how you make choices actually matter. I would argue that these different world states is exactly what the rest of this game needed more of and reflects the player's choices back at them far better than an ending cutscene ever could. As we're about to discuss with the ending cutscenes, they feel largely hollow due to you being told what your actions caused as opposed to seeing and feeling it for yourself. So ends the interregnum, and now Emily Caldwin I will take her mother's throne after a season of turmoil. The ending cutscene is a series of still scenes with the outsider narrating on the consequences of your actions. These scenes are reductive and borderline worthless in my opinion. The narration and content of the scenes are slanted one direction or the other, typically depicting good outcomes for low chaos playthroughs and violent and darker variations for high chaos, and that's it. While the content is I guess fine, the presentation feels rushed and anticlimactic. These cutscenes don't feel like the culmination of your choices. It is particularly puzzling to me why this was the direction Arcane went with for the ending, especially because in my mind there's an obvious alternative that would be better. When Corvo first meets the Outsider, there's a short sequence of him traveling through the void, and during this scene you can witness different characters frozen in place. Another scene similar to this would have made more sense, have more of your choices represented by frozen characters or interactables that the Outsider would provide commentary or explanation on. The ending cutscenes already kind of look like this, so why not just allow the player to walk around in those spaces? This is also necessary in my opinion because there are a few topics we see in the ending that warrant further explanation. The first of these is the Rat Plague. In the Low Chaos ending, the Outsider states that the plague was cured, and we see Piero and Sokolov working in a lab with patients lined up. This feels cheap, and I can't be the only one that wants to know how they cured the plague. As I mentioned before in this video, the presentation of the Weepers in-game implies an infection that destroys a large part of the brain, so magically developing a cure doesn't seem likely. Now additionally and more importantly, both the ending cutscene as well as comments made during the final mission imply that Emily is Corvo's daughter. This has obviously been confirmed with the sequel, but it seems lazy to not give any sort of follow up on this. Is this something that Emily knew and just never talked about, or did Corvo have to explain it to her after this whole ordeal? These are big questions that are just not answered by the ending. Even something like having an epilogue mission where Corvo and Emily return to the Hound Pits a year later and have the discussion would have worked. What I'm getting at is this reveal feels rushed, or like the developers were just trying to be cute by intentionally not providing an explanation, and it's missed potential. And as we reach the ending of the main narrative, that phrase, missed potential, sums up my feelings on both the story and chaos system quite well. However, I'm going to set those aside for now and turn this discussion towards the gameplay, because I think it has just as much a role to play in Dishonored's successes as well as its faults. I'll be crafting your weapons and gear. All custom work. For you, I will create the tools of a master assassin. The title for this chapter originally had two contenders. The first was The God Equation. If you can for the moment, set aside the edgelord nature of that name and you'll see that it actually is quite accurate. The toolkit given to players in combination with the expertly crafted levels successfully makes you feel like some sort of unstoppable force. I honestly can't believe how good the first person combat feels in this game, particularly the sword. 
This is something that's still on the surface floors me in 2022 as I'm making this video. Skyrim was released about a year prior to Dishonored, and in making this video I thought it would be a useful comparison given they share the same camera perspective, the same parent company in ZeniMax, and roughly the same release period. The differences are night and day. The combat system that Arcane built for the game is impressive, however I find myself more skeptical of its achievement the more time I spend with the game, which leads me to the second title I considered for this chapter, Surrounded by Idiots. I say skeptical because it's hard to tell if the combat system only feels this good because of how dumb the enemy AI is. Do they just seem dumb because of the powerful tools you have, or do you feel powerful simply because the AI is so dumb? In effect, is the game just tricking you into feeling this way not because of your skill, but rather the deficiencies in the game's AI? It's sort of like the chicken and the egg. Now, if you were paying attention, you might recognize that the title of this chapter was neither of those. It was called A Knife in the Dark. Despite the attention I just gave the game's combat system, make no mistake that Dishonored is a stealth game. The game wants you to play stealthily, but it also doesn't. The developers at Arcane Studio want you to play stealthily, but also they don't. I'm genuinely not trying to sound cute or mysterious here either. Dishonored is a stealth game that spends 50% of its time trying to convince you that it isn't. If you need evidence of this, look at the upgrade screen in Piero's shop. The vast majority of upgrades are for combat. Upgrades to your pistol, crossbow, and spring razor. You can buy armor and the ability to better win sword duels with guards. None of these are useful in a stealth playthrough. Half of the supernatural powers you get from the outsider are irrelevant on a stealth playthrough, whereas every single one of them is useful in a combat playthrough. You have access to frag grenades. <laughs> Why? Why are there frag grenades in a stealth game? The game's stealth systems suffer from becoming too easy too quickly. This is caused by three smaller issues that compound together to create the problem. The issues are as follows. Resource balance, lack of encounter variety, and the stealth is mechanically basic. Let's start with the first one. The world is filled to the brim with resources, bullets, health elixirs, mana potions, crossbow bolts, grenades, even on the highest difficulty, which just promotes less thoughtful use of them. I agree that there should be greater access to resources on easy or normal, as developers want to make sure that players have chances to try out the full toolkit, but on higher difficulties it should be severely limited. While not entirely a stealth game, The Last of Us is a good example of what this looks like. It successfully balances the resource availability with the selected difficulty. This is a must for a good stealth game in my eyes. Resource economy works in tandem with difficulty, because in most stealth games resources are tools to escape combat, correct mistakes, or assist stealth. Any necessary action is in short extreme bursts, but comes at the cost of valuable resources. Dishonored is already particularly well suited for less resource availability during missions anyways because of its hub world. Less resources in the world would create a natural cycle where players make purchases from Piero at the Hound Pits before going out on missions. They would then extensively explore the mission areas in order to acquire more money, which is then used once back at the hub in order to replenish any used resources. This also creates more player agency on what they are spending their limited money on, resources versus upgrades. This dominoes into the second point, which is that the game lacks meaningful variety in the stealth encounters you experience. A good stealth game should feel like an arms race, swinging back and forth between introducing new abilities that make you feel powerful and then new challenges that make you feel vulnerable. Most stealth games do this through the introduction of new enemy types, and so I think that's a good place to start this discussion. As a quick recap, I want to go through the game's enemies. To start with, there are seven human types of enemies. The standard city watch guards, the watch captains who wear the more formal coats and have pistols, overseers, music box overseers, weepers, bottle street gang members, and the whaler assassins. There are the tall boys, which I'm putting into their own category, as well as the boss encounters with the Royal Interrogator, Dowd, and Granny Rags that are also going to be their own category. 
And finally, the animal enemies, which include the wolfhounds, river crusts, the rats, and the hagfish. Right out the gate, I want to remove several of these, the three boss encounters, for instance. While they were all fantastic, I don't truly consider them enemies like the rest of these. They were one-time bosses. I also want to remove three of the four animals, the rats, hagfish, and the river crusts. Hopefully these make sense in explaining away. None utilize the game's detection system and are more an obstacle in the traditional sense than an enemy, similar to, say, the different pieces of Sokolov's security technology. This leaves nine different enemies. At first glance, maybe this seems like it makes sense. There are nine levels, so one new enemy for each. Unfortunately, all of these enemies act almost identical when it comes to the stealth side of the game. With one exception, it doesn't matter if it's a standard guard patrolling or a captain, an overseer or a weeper, the method of dealing with them are all exactly the same. Choke them out if you can get close to them, or sleep dart them if you can't. All of the enemies with just one exception detect the player in the same way and feel like they become alert at the same rate. Finally, and more importantly, all of these enemies are quickly outpaced by the supernatural powers you get. The powers you will always have access to because of the broken resource economy, meaning that mana elixirs are everywhere. Even the whaler assassins are barely a challenge despite having powers themselves. So what good is having all of these powers and gadgets if there aren't enemies that can challenge their use? There was potential here for Arcane to create enemies that were counters for specific equipment or powers, and that in turn required new strategies to deal with. The game actually does do this a bit, both the Tallboys and the Weepers are immune to the Rat Swarm ability. Tallboys because they are simply out of range, and the Weepers because the Rats won't attack them. The Overseers with the Music Boxes are another example, and serve as a counter to powers in general due to their music disabling them. They were great to fight against in combat, but unfortunately I never had to deal with them in stealth, making them essentially meaningless. The Dow DLC actually cleverly advances this mechanic by having a location play the music over a speaker system, effectively shutting down all power usage while in the location. It forces the player to change their strategy during that mission. Now imagine if the Whaler Assassins had powers in a meaningful way, like perhaps they were immune to the effects of Ben Time. Or if the Wolfhounds could smell you when you entered into an area and would actively start hunting you. These unique characteristics would allow for mixing and matching of different enemy types to create more challenging scenarios. Now, unique enemy designs are not the only solution to this particular issue. There are many terrific stealth games that have low numbers of enemy types, but manage to use those enemies to create high numbers of situational diversity. This is done through variations in enemy positioning, numbers and movement, as well as level design and player resources. Unfortunately, this setup comes with the requirement that openly engaging enemies is dangerous, which isn't the case in Dishonored, largely due to half of its focus being on the combat. This brings us to the last issue, which is that Dishonored stealth system is mechanically basic. For example, the game doesn't feature any sort of visibility meter, and as such can lead to silly moments where you're perched atop a light pole in broad daylight and guards don't see you. Other staples of the genre, such as understanding field of vision on enemies and patrol routes, won't become necessary on most playthroughs, even on the hardest difficulty. There are certainly ways to impose limits on yourself, such as not using the powers at all, and that can increase the difficulty of the game, for sure. However, I don't think it's fair to expect players to make the game difficult for themselves when the developers have failed to do so. Many people play stealth games with the expectation of being challenged, but Dishonored's desire to include action combat meant that the traditional stealth systems had to be stripped down to the basics in order to incorporate those desires. As bad as these issues are, there's something even more sinister still lurking in the shadows. This section was titled A Knife in the Dark, not because of the game's stealth requiring neither of those things, although I find that funny looking back at it now. I told you that Dishonored and the developers over at Arcane want you to play this game stealthily, and I meant it, despite everything I just detailed that suggests otherwise. Dishonored is a stealth game, and like a stealth game, the true enemy is the one you don't see, crouched in the shadows waiting for your back to turn so it can stab you. The true enemy for both the combat and stealth systems is none other than our old friend, the Chaos System. And it would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for that meddling YouTuber. 
All jokes aside, I truly do mean this. The developers have prioritized giving players the ability to play this game however they want, but by playing the game in any way other than non-lethal stealth, it funnels you into high chaos. Meaning that if you want the good ending, then combat simply isn't an option. I would go so far as to say that the chaos system strongly compels you into almost always doing a low chaos playthrough. It feels sort of like Mass Effect for me in that way. However, unlike Mass Effect, I don't particularly care if my allies in Dishonored die or not. The obvious solution is to decouple the gameplay from the chaos system. Perhaps there could be some sort of toggle in the options menu, some sort of killing increases chaos box that players can switch on or off depending on the experience they're looking for. Another potential solution could be to have it relate to difficulty. Maybe any of the options above the normal difficulty could include killing as a part of its chaos metric. Unfortunately, the game can't actually do these because there aren't enough meaningful choices or actions in the game to warrant the chaos system alone, and so it needs to be tied to the gameplay because it's the only option. And I hope that by this point the problems with the chaos system are apparent, it just plainly doesn't work. Now, I can already foresee the comments I'm likely going to get on this specific subject because they are the same comments that always get brought up when it comes to the chaos system and gameplay. That the way Arcane stitched these aspects of the game together is exactly the point, and that players should be punished for playing with the toolkit that the developers put in the game. Gamers want the game to praise them as a mighty hero for taking all of those fun powers and sadistically killing a bunch of dudes who were just doing their jobs. I'm not making this up either, this is actually what some people think, that the game is somehow testing you and asking that you play a less complete version of it in order to prove that you're a good person. Listen, I love this game series, I love the world and lore, and I love playing it stealthily and non-lethally, but this is a dog shit take and I have to wonder if the person who wrote that was simply a troll. I also say that with no disrespect, at least as little as possible when referring to someone else's opinion as dog shit or possibly even a joke. Reactively creating this narrative that the character of the outsider is trying to tempt you into playing violently frankly shows a novice understanding of the character and the world. Ironic. It's actually surprising to me that someone can play through the game and consider the outsider evil, at least any more evil than an organization like the Abbey. Arcane created a world that thrives in the shades of grey, both within the color palette but also the moral ambiguity. This is especially illustrated with the heart gameplay mechanic. During Corvo's first visit into the void, he is given a tool, a supernatural heart that players can use to learn secrets about the world. While I don't personally use this mechanic much while I play, when used on an NPC you can learn their secrets, which typically paint the individual as either good, bad, or somewhere in between. So going back to the point of it being wrong to kill a guard who is allegedly just doing their job, is it still wrong to kill one of them if it's revealed that he will kill two people himself that evening? Or that he beats his son? Or that he's previously murdered someone and framed another for that crime? To be clear, I'm not saying that these people do deserve to be killed, I'm just asking these questions to illustrate that not everything is as it seems in this universe. To dismissively declare the outsider as this universe's version of the devil, I think is to miss the nuances of the character and the game world at large. At first glance, a major theme of the game is that power corrupts. It's spelled out to you at almost every turn. The individuals you are targeting are all in positions of power and use that authority to benefit themselves or oppress others. It's seen again in the narrative when your allies betray you for their own chance at power. Arcane attempted to inject these themes into Dishonored's gameplay with the chaos system, and they did so unsuccessfully, to which it seems they likely agree given that they removed the system from the latest game in the franchise. So it might be easy on the surface to think of the outsider and his powers as evil. However, I think after taking a step back, a more complete view of the game's theme can be seen. Dishonored is a revenge story and is ultimately the Count of Monte Cristo of video games. The core theme of the game, as well as that novel, are choices and their consequences. But again, in Dishonored, there only seems to be consequences for the overtly violent actions and nothing else. 
The game wants you to believe that your choices are going to be visible in a meaningful way outside of just increased guards and rats. Your actions affect the city, it tells you in a tutorial prompt early in the game, however it never lives up to this promise. That being said, I will almost always applaud a game studio for trying something new, like Arcane attempted with the Chaos system. If done properly with more depth, I believe it could become an industry standard and replace the generic morality system. The game's story, despite having its own set of problems, has an almost fairy tale quality to it that, when paired with Arcane's art style, makes it punch above its weight, in my opinion. The setting of Dunwall is also incredible, and manages to stand out in an industry already overflowing with terrific settings. Similar to my Red Dead 2 video, I worry that I will come across as overly negative in this video given the amount of time I spend criticizing Dishonored's flaws. As I stated at the beginning, this is a game and series that are high on my list of all-time favorites, and while Dishonored certainly has its problems, many of them in fact, they don't outweigh the good in my opinion. However, things can always be done better. I tend to be the most critical of my favorite games and series because I've spent the most time with them, as well as the desire for them to be the best that they possibly can. I don't understand how this got so unpleasant. And with the series resting for now, it's a perfect time to examine it in order to determine what has worked, but also what is holding it back. That way, when Dishonored inevitably slinks out from the Not Shadows again in the future, we have some in-depth points of comparison. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the series can blink itself to new heights instead of new lows. If you've made it this far, I want to say thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed it and you're interested in more videos like this, consider subscribing to my channel. The completion of this video is actually a big milestone for me because it was the one I created this YouTube channel for originally. It's my hope for this to be the first in a series of videos critiquing the entire Dishonored franchise, as well as Arcane Studios' other prominent releases. The next video will actually immediately follow up on this one and focus on the Dowd DLC since I'm in the Dishonored mindset. Now I have a couple of random thoughts that didn't fit naturally anywhere into the script, but I still wanted to mention them so I'm just going to list them off here. The first is on Bone Charms. If you've played the game, then you know that I didn't cover this aspect of the game at all. While they're technically gameplay, I omitted them because they didn't really fit in with that part of the video. Overall, I find Bone Charms underwhelming, specifically because of their randomization. It's hard to plan a playthrough of the game when you don't know if you'll get more combat or stealth-focused charms throughout it. I think the second Dishonored actually completely fixes this problem with the charm crafting aspect of it, which is one of the parts I'm most excited to talk about with that game. The other remark I have is just a small detail that I enjoyed. As you use Blink to teleport away from someone, their voice distorts and becomes a lower frequency for a few seconds. This is a demonstration of the physics phenomenon known as the Doppler effect, and as a science teacher out in the real world, I just appreciated the small detail. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, and that's all. Again, thanks for watching. Have you ever seen the ritual? I've never seen the heretic's brand used. No, it's a rare occurrence. But I did spy the face of one so branded. A former member of our order, of course. Out on a retreat, we passed through a fishing town. Saw him begging. What were his crimes? Who can say?